Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to bring this meeting, first meeting of the new year, to order, uh, please. And without further ado, where's Tina? Call the roll, please. Commissioner Scott's going to lead the invocation and pledge. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so first order of business, I apologize for the little interruption in the beginning, but Tony wanted me to let you know that each one of your places you have an I legislate screen over here to me. It's on my left. I think it's on your left. Please don't mess with that. It's for county commission. It's for county commission uh, meetings and workshops. So uh, no need to be on there. Just leave it. Okay. So onward with the. Um, Setting the framework for our year going forward. Whit, would you like to? Madam Chair, that's that's the agenda for the board workshop for reference at a later point in the meeting. It's time to do introductions of the board members. Wait a second. Yeah, that's for, I'm, I'll touch on this later on. Which one are you working off of? Okay. Sorry about that. Tony, you're fired. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is introduce the new members of the board. Or let's just go around and we'll start with Commissioner Floyd. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm Richie Floyd, District 8, City Council, St. Petersburg, Florida. <laughs> I'm Patty Reed, the Vice Mayor of the Austin City of Pinellas Park. Brother John Muhammad, City Council Member for St. Petersburg, District 7. Good. Ryan Scott, Pinellas County Commission, District 2. Julie Ward, Bajalski, Mayor of the Great City of Dunedin. I'm Whit Blanton, Executive Director. David. Dave Albritton, uh, Councilman, City of Clearwater, and Treasurer for Ford Pinellas. And a new face. Gina Driscoll, St. Petersburg City Council, representing PSTA. Chris Burke, Vice Mayor, City of Seminole, representing the inland communities. Excellent. So, uh, Tina, do we have cards for citizens to be heard? We have two citizens wishing to address the board today, and the first is Sharon Calvert. All right. Sharon, please come forward. And if the board members could remember to turn their mics on and off whenever you're speaking, please, thank you. Good, morning. Good afternoon. Happy New Year. Thank I'm, you. I'm Sharon Calvert. I live in Chair Verde. At the November Ford Pinellas meeting, I asked for copies of documentation and communication related to a project in Tierra Verde called a cycle track. To date, I have not received any response. I cannot find any project description and project title cycle track. There was no project ever called Cycle Track presented to Terra Verde residents. How did the Cycle Track project get approved if there's no project for a Cycle Track? Regarding the 34th Street South Lane elimination, there is no organization representing residents who use that corridor that supports the road diet. This project in your tip is described as a resurfacing project. FDOT describes the project as repaving, sidewalk widening, and safety improvements. How did this board know this project was implementing a road diet if the project is not described properly in your own planning documents? What did you approve? How would the public have ever known that you were eliminating a general lane of vehicle traffic? 
with ridership of the Sunrunner declining 43% since fares were instituted last year and ridership well below what was promised, I ask this board to stop the 34th Street South Lane elimin elimination now. In addition, I made a public comment at the November uh, Ford Pinellas meeting about the lack of public engagement regarding the 34th Street Lane elimination. Mr. Blanton was allowed to respond and he stated there was a public hearing held. You can see it in the video. To correct the public record, there was only one public meeting that was held in April of 2019 and it was when it was a proposed project. There was never a public hearing and FDOT unfortunately at this time does not require any public hearing for lane eliminations. And it is not appropriate for staff to try to rebut a citizen's public comment without having the facts or allowing the citizen to respond as well. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have David Geddes Jr. Mm -hmm. Hello David. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. David Ballard Geddes Jr. David Ballard Geddes Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. This government is a government claiming to be of the people, by the people, and for the people, as spoken by Abraham Lincoln in his Gettysburg Address. The Federalist Papers reveal these three constitutions as the former, the latter, and the last resort. Such people of the former, by the latter, and for the last resort are people as being seen as being an enumerated class of people embedded in Article I, Section 2 of our existing Constitution. Such enumerated members have assailed itself constitutionally as a peacetime ship of war in Article I, Section 10, here to capture both land and water, seen as an act of reprisal recognized as a Letter of Marquis in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11. Such peacetime ship of war, as enumerated, is seen in the Declaration of Independence as that of one of being prudent, a war of attrition, as it will be, stating a long train of usurpations, perfidy, and death, declaring that mankind is more disposed to suffer while evils are still sufferable. Our current constitution, this war of attrition, is in total violation in and of itself when it constitutes itself as a letter of marquee, as an act of reprisal in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11, yet simultaneously prohibits such letters of marquee and reprisals in Article 1, Section 10. Our current constitution, this prudent ship of rebellious hypocrisy is a defective, insurrected, evil war of attrition used as a medium to take liberty, property, and life, giving rise to unwarranted water jurisdictions under the 14th Amendment, intent on vanquishing Christianity based on Federalist Paper Number 2, declaring itself free to levy war, deaf to the voice of justice, the duplicit nature and the counterfeiting capabilities of the Declaration of Independence itself is in question. Moving forward on such constitutional grounds is on notice. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have a recognition of an outgoing uh, member, Brian Smith. Brian, would you like to come up to the podium, please? And our executive director will join you. <coughs> well, uh, this is uh, very bittersweet because Brian has been my mentor for a long, long time. Uh, I've known Brian since, what, 1988 or 89 or so. I was your consultant a long time ago. Uh, Brian uh, previously was the MPO director. He was the planning director. I think you were the PPC director at one point. And for the last 10 years, he's been the chair of our Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee, and he has done an excellent job 
uh, leading a diverse group of, of technical and non-technical citizens uh, to address issues related to the Pinellas Trail, related to our roadways, safety, accessibility, and we really have appreciated your leadership and guidance, and you've taken on a statewide leadership role with the Greenways and Trails Foundation. That's true. And um, just wondered if uh, you wanted to say a few words, but I just wanted to thank you. And we have a little small token you can put on your mantle shelf, just acknowledging your service to Ford Pinellas. And that doesn't even come close to compensating for the 40 plus years you've given to this county. Thank you. But thank you. Just a couple words. What I should mention is I moved from a staff position into a committee position. Like Whit said, and actually I, I retired in 2011, November, and then by 2012 I was on the committee as not a staff person, but then as a member, and then maybe the chairman because of my background. Um, but what I want to mention is that the last decade, things have really taken off in that, that period. And um, up to that time, trails were considered a local matter. And uh, it was during this, t this last tenure period that the state took on the mantle of responsibility for that whole program and funding it and everything. So for instance, and the Pinellas County Trail was the forefront of that. It was the example they decided about how to do it. So we started off with the Coast to Coast Trail where the Pinellas um, segment was first and first funded. And that was a very, and then from there, that whole state, the state funded program, the Coast to Coast Trail, um, was so successful the legislature then established a whole program of funding for the state, 25 million a year. And we're pretty much at the forefront of pushing all that. So the point I'm making is the last 10 years have been really pretty significant in terms of statewide recognition of trails. And the Pinellas County was at the forefront of that. So it's pretty good. Thank you very much for the opportunity beyond the community. <laughs> and uh, Whit, we also have a recognition of outgoing board member Jared Buckman, who yes. uh, was on the Ford, has been on the Forward Pinellas Board. And I'm gonna invite Jared up to say a few words. And as he's coming up, I just wanna let everybody know that Oldsmar has appointed uh, his replacement, it will be Andrew Knapp, and he will be joining us at the February meeting and should be here for the workshop in February. Jared, we're gonna miss you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Wade. Uh, fellow board members, really appreciated time serving with you guys. Um, really enjoyed everything we did here. Um, I had a blast working here. Unfortunately, some irreconcilable, irreconcilable conflicts with my employer in Form 6 are causing my resignation from Oldsmar, so I've had to resign from this board, but um, I'll still be around. I think I'm gonna find a way to come back, but. Um, Appreciate everybody and appreciate working with everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, for the record, our Citizens Advisory Committee does not require Form 6, so you're more than welcome to come and <laughs> be a citizen. All right, next we are on consent. Does any board member have any item that they wish to pull from consent? Anybody? If not, I'll entertain a motion to- Move to approve. Okay. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please designate by saying aye. 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 Okay. Madam Chair? Yes. May I state for the record that there were no citizens wishing to be heard on the consent agenda? Okay, thank you. Um, now we're on to the Pinellas Planning Council public hearing items. And we're going to conduct these hearings as follows. Uh, ask forward Pinellas staff to present the items. The applicant local governments are available for questions as needed. Once each presentation is given, I'll then ask for proponents of any of the proposals to speak, then opponents, and finally, any other citizen who wish to comment or ask questions on the case. We'll then hear rebuttal by the applicant as necessary and a staff response or a summary. At that time, the board will ask questions and then I will close the public hearing and the board will deliberate and take action. So, uh, Good afternoon. Okay, this is the first of three cases for today, and this comes from the city of Clearwater. 
So it is a 0.54 acre site located at 210 Meadowlark Lane. Existing countywide plan map category is residential low medium, and proposed countywide plan map category would be public and semi-public. It is currently vacant and the proposed use is a softball field. So this is a depiction of the location and showing that it is within a clear water jurisdiction. So the properties are owned by First Baptist Church of Clearwater, and the church has continued to purchase properties in the area, and it's part of a 41-acre main parcel. As the athletic facilities have expanded over time, the properties have been annexed and incorporated into the main parcel. Future land use and zoning amendments have been approved to ensure that the overall property would have consistent designation. So as you can see, the surrounding uses to the north is the existing baseball field and then existing batting cages and storage to the east. There is some single family to the south and an RV park to the west. Just another aerial view of the amendment and then a road view as well. So the countywide plan map designation would change to the public semi-public category. And as you can see, the surrounding area also owned by the church is within that same category. So in conclusion, the surrounding area is consistent with the locational characteristics for the proposed category. Institutional uses are permitted under the public semi-public category and would not adversely affect the nearby properties. And the proposed amendment allows development that's in character with the future land use map designations without any acreage threshold limitations. So we recommend approval. Any questions for that one? Anyone have any questions or concerns or thoughts or? Okay. Well, I was just going to get there. Okay. <laughs> Gina spoke so quickly. Do we have any uh, proponents, <coughs> Tina? Madam Chair, there are no proponents, opponents, or other citizens wishing to be heard on this. Perfect. Then we're going to close the public hearing. And now uh, Gina's already made a motion move forward and was there a second 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 by Commissioner Floyd all those in favor please um, designate by saying aye. aye aye okay now we are on item 6 a number 2 case CW 24-02 and am I understand you'll do this presentation as I well will. Please go forward uh, second case for today comes from Pinellas County. The subject property is a 0 0.19 acre site located at 2685 Park Street in West Leelman. Existing countywide plan map categories, residential low medium, and proposed is retail and services. It is vacant currently, but the applicant is seeking this change of countywide play map category to be RV and boat storage. Graphic showing the subject area as well as that it is within unincorporated Pinellas County jurisdiction. Single family is existing to the north and multifamily to the east, warehouse and commercial to the south and western area. The requested amendment to retail and services would permit a wide range of non-residential and residential uses intended for areas that support and are compatible with intense commercial uses. So the proposed land use change would establish one classification for the entire parent parcel as well. And again, the property is planned to be used as a recreational vehicle and boat storage use. So scenic non-commercial corridor on Park Street is an enhancement connector. Um, however, there is an, a restriction of over 500 feet from the right-of-way line that the rules would not be in place for scenic non-commercial corridor, and the property boundary is 527 feet away from the right-of-way line. So 
So in conclusion, um, the surrounding area is, is consistent with the locational characteristics for the proposed category. Very, the requested amendment to retail and services would permit a wide range of non-residential and residential uses intended for areas that support and are compatible with intense commercial uses. And the proposed amendment either does not involve or would not significantly impact any remaining countywide considerations. So we find the proposed amendment consistent with the relevant countywide considerations and recommend approval. Is there any questions with this one? Are there any uh, proponents that we have, Tina? No, Madam Chair, there's no proponents, opponents, or citizens wishing to be heard on this matter. Okay. Then we will go ahead and close the public hearing, and uh, I will entertain a motion. David? Then moved and seconded. All those in favor, please designate by saying aye. 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 All right, now we are on 6A number three. It's case CW24-03, the City of St. Petersburg. Emma has a presentation on that as well. Go ahead, Emma. Okay. So last one for today. It is a 0.41 acre site located at 266th Street North in St. Petersburg. Existing countywide plan map category is office, and the proposed countywide plan map category is multimodal corridor. Existing use is single family, and the proposed amendment is to allow for redevelopment of the property and the support of multifamily housing in the form of nine townhomes with the potential for retail or other permitted mixed uses. The graphic showing the subject area, and that is it, it is within the St. Petersburg jurisdiction. Surrounding uses, the north is single family residential, as well as to the east and to the south is retail office and then a multifamily complex to the west. Other aerial and street view of the amendment area. So you can see the existing category of office would be amended to multimodal corridor, and this application does come soon after the parcel directly to the south, which was also approved for amendment to multimodal corridor. So this is just a depiction of the multimodal corridors on our land use strategy map. The property is located near the Central Avenue Multimodal Corridor designation, and this area has been deemed appropriate to be designated as a multimodal corridor pursuant to the requirements of the countywide rules. It is a premium transit corridor which supports the highest level of density and intensity. So this graphic provided from the city of St. Pete is just showing that the amendment area is identified as an area with a high potential for redevelopment as part of the Sunrunner Development Study. Therefore, the requested amendment will further the recommendations of the Sunrunner Development Study. And the site is located within a short walking distance of the 66th Street Sunrunner bus station. So in conclusion, the subject property is located within close proximity to an existing Sunrider station, and it was identified as an area that could be redeveloped with a more transit supportive uses. Surrounding area is consistent with the locational characteristics for the proposed category. And the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the multimodal corridor category. Staff finds the proposed amendment is consistent and would recommend approval. There was some public comment um, heard by the city and the main idea of those was not in support of density increase or um, negative traffic impacts. And that's all that I have. If you have any questions or discussions on this one. Any questions? Yes, Commissioner Burke. I was just gonna ask, didn't we already do this one, but was, was that the lot south? It was the parcel directly to the south, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Questions? Thoughts, concerns? Okay. Um, we are now, we have no, no proponents. Madam Chair, there are no citizens wishing to be heard on this matter, no proponents or opponents. Okay, so may I have a motion from the board? 
Second. It's been moved by Eric Gerard, second by Commissioner Scott. All those in favor, please designate by saying aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Um, now we have a presentation from PSTA. Oh, Gina, you're going to do the presentation? Yes, I, um, it's actually not a presentation. It was just my regular update from our most recent meeting. Okay. Um, the PSCA board met on December 6, 2023. PSCA now oversees the van pool services contract that was previously overseen by TBARDA. And so the board approved a two-month purchase order for van pool services that will allow service to continue while the procurement process is completed. The new contract will be brought back to the board in February. The board discussed committee appointments for a number of vacancies and um, other committee vacancies are going to be brought back to the board um, at our January meeting, which will take place on January 24th, 2024 at 9 a.m. Thank you. You're welcome. And um, are there any questions or concerns with regard to Gina's report? No? Commissioner Burke? Just one. Is the Van Pool only in Pinellas County or is it, is it multi county? The Tabarda one? Um, sorry, I believe um, that the entire operation was, was um, contracted to, to PSTA. So they'll be operating, doing everything that T-Barter was doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. And of course that could change um, as things go along and um, the heart gets on its feet. So you never know. But for now we're, uh, um, the PSTA is, is happy to, to take that over and continue that service for the people who have come to rely on it. You know, it's kind of interesting that um, most of the van pools are in Hillsborough County and serve Hillsborough County. So PSTA taking that over is, is a big accomplishment. We do have or have had on our priority list uh, a line item for additional funding for the van pool program to serve Pinellas County as well. So that's something we can certainly revisit now that PSTA is in charge. All right. <clears throat> So now we have we are on item number seven, uh, board endorsement of regional transportation uh -oh. priorities. Seven B regional activities report first. Oh, did I skip one? I'm so sorry. That's okay. Okay, regional activities. I'll report. cover that Who's one. Who's doing that with? I'll do it. Uh, good afternoon, board members. In your uh, agenda packet, uh, there is a letter to Secretary Gwen, and I'll just uh, outline uh, where we stand on our regional merger discussion uh, with the Hillsborough and Pasco MPOs. Uh, we do have a meeting upcoming on February 16th of the Transportation Management Area Leadership Group to talk to begin talking about uh, different board governance uh, scenarios for what that three-county MPO could look like um, at, um, if it becomes uh, reality. Uh, the Hillsboro uh, MPO has a special meeting uh, coming up on February 6th to present to their full board uh, the scenarios that will be presenting to the TMA Leadership Group. Uh, and that's generally because they want their representatives to have uh, the ability to say this is the policy or the direction that we've been given from our full board. Uh, we have not really done that with our board members, but I do take this opportunity before each TMA leadership group meeting to give you a preview of what we're going to be talking about. We, um, in general, and I'll just keep it very high level, but the scenarios for board governance structure would include things like um, uh, if, if, if the seats for the board have to be based on population, uh, we know that Hillsborough County has the largest population of any county. We know that City of Tampa has 450 or so thousand people, so they're going to be represented as well. But there are some questions about the operating agencies. So in Hillsborough, on their board, they have elected officials and non-elected officials who vote on transportation matters such as the Port Tampa Bay, uh, the Tampa Air International Airport, the Planning Commission, uh, the uh, Tampa Hillsboro Expressway Authority, et cetera. And the question is, if we form a regional MPO, do we have uh, a similar setup at the regional level where non-elected officials serve on the board and vote? As you know here, that's not the case, or all elected officials. 
Uh, the other question related to that is, since the port and airport, and potentially FIA and others are regional organizations, should that voting member not count against Hillsborough's allocation? Should it be sort of off the top? And then you base on population. And there's pros and cons to that discussion as well. Another facet of that conversation could be, do those operating agencies actually vote, or are they non-voting advisors, such as how the Florida Department of Transportation operates statewide? Um, so those are questions we'll have. Uh, we also will discuss the role of PSTA as a, a voting member of this board and maybe on a regional board. And we also have the Hillsborough Area Regional Transit Authority, which is uh, a, a similar independent transit agency. In Pasco County, the transit system's under the Pasco County government, so the county commissions represent that, much like our St. Pete Clearwater International Airport is under the county commission. Um, so um, lots to talk about in terms of that governance structure. We'll also entertain maybe a concept or two that looks at the role of smaller cities that might not uh, be able to garner a seat on the board because of population size, and we've got a few around the table here today. Um, and, and, and should there be maybe an advisory committee of smaller cities that then elects every year or every couple of years a member of that advisory committee to serve on the voting board. And that could be more than one. Um, you know, it's really how you, you want to structure this. There are some general federal guidance and there's some general state guidance on this, but ultimately each MPO takes on the flavor and culture of the region in which it operates. So we have a lot of discretion about how we can set that up. So that'll be the first of several conversations. We won't be making a decision on February 16th, but we will be exploring that. And in the context of exploring those options, uh, our staff is doing some research on MPOs around the country that have a similar setup at a regional level. And we're gonna be bringing examples to the, to the group uh, that, um, that document how they've set up their boards and their advisory committees to make sure that there's a balance between suburban and outlying areas and core urban cities, um, because that's always you know, a bit of a balancing act when you talk about transportation funding. The letter uh, that I referenced at the beginning of this discussion to the secretary outlines an initial startup expense um, of $500,000 to uh, begin setting up the regional MPO through the uh, assistance of a management consultant and legal uh, advisor. And we all felt it was best to get an independent legal advisor rather than relying on one of the county's or MPO's attorneys just to keep it independent. Um, we have made this request. Um, I believe we've submitted the request to Senator Hooper's office and Representative McClure's office, who's a Hillsborough County representative, to have uh, this uh, introduced into the state budget. Uh, I think the Florida Department of Transportation is willing to assist us in this funding. Uh, instead of going the legislative route, but in speaking with my counterpart in Hillsborough County, uh, they, they think it might look better um, to have the legislature fund this because the legislature put it in Senate Bill 425 last year that passed the session. And um, we want to make sure that the Florida Department of Transportation is seen as an independent uh, entity when it comes to discussions about the merger. In other words, not taking a position for or against, but just letting things run their course. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have, but we have a lot going on this year at the regional level, and I would encourage anybody who's interested in attending the TMA Leadership Group uh, to please do so. Chelsea, I believe it'll be live streamed. Yes, so it will be live streamed, so if you don't wanna trek over to the airport where the meeting will be held, you can, um, you can watch it live. But any member of this board is able to go and you can speak, and uh, we have three members who vote, but. I don't think we'll be taking too many votes at this meeting. I think it'll be more discussion and feedback. So I encourage you to show up if you'd like to. Anybody have any questions for me on that? Have fun with that. <laughs> it's gonna be fun. It's been fun for a couple of years. I have questions. I will ask them off the record. Sure. For now. Um, okay, so Anyone else want to address the board on this issue? Anybody? Pro or con? No? Okay, Chelsea, I see you standing in the wings. Waiting patiently. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so I do not have a formal presentation for you today, but I am going to ask you to refer to the priority lists in your packet. 
Um, this is the time of year that we uh, take up the priorities that are set by the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance and also a subset of that which is the Transportation Management Area Leadership Group. So the TMA Leadership Group represents the three MPOs in the urban core of Pinellas, Pasco, and Hillsboro. It is a subset of the broader SCTPA which covers all the way up from Hernando Citrus down to Sarasota Manatee and out to Polk County. And this body meets regularly and adopts a list of annual major priority projects that are then transmitted to each of the MPOs for their basically ratification, if you will. And then we transmit them to FDOT saying these are the projects that we as a, as a whole region support and could benefit from our collective advocacy. So you may notice that one list is a direct subset of another. And that's really because the TMA takes action on the projects that directly impact the three county region and then they transmit those to the broader region where the other MPOs then add their projects on top of that. So the, pro the, the lists are pretty much exactly the same in that regard. So I'm going to kind of draw your attention to some of the changes that have been made to this list in the past year. Um, at the top, uh, very much like our own priority list, we leave projects on this list until they are 100% complete just in case something comes up and additional funding may be needed or additional support from our local uh, leaders, they stay on until complete. So we highlighted a few projects that have been completed just to kind of show some of the success that we've had as a region. And then you'll see a very large section in the middle, what is, which is our funded priorities. And specific to Pinellas County, those priorities include the Howard Franklin Bridge replacement that's currently under construction, the Gateway Expressway project, which is also under construction, and then a new one that we've been able to add to the funded list is the I-275 express lanes from 38th Avenue North up to 4th Street. That's a newly funded project, so we're able to move that up, and we're very happy to see that move forward. Below that are our unfunded top priorities for the Tampa Bay region. And in Pinellas County, that includes the I-275 express lanes from 375 up to 38th Avenue North. That is That project is moving through the design phases, but is not yet funded for construction, so we definitely want to advocate for that. And then the other projects uh, that touch Pinellas include the regional rapid transit and the I-275 corridor. Um, and that is it for the Pinellas projects. Um, I will say that we did add three new projects to the regional priority list uh, this year, two of which are in Hillsborough County. That includes the Hart Heavy Maintenance Facility. Uh, this is a project that Hart has been advocating for for a number of years because their current maintenance facility um, is not really able to accommodate uh, its current needs. And then the Florida-Tampa bus rapid transit line, this is a, a transit connection from downtown Tampa up to USF. And then the third project that was added is the Pasco-Hernando County Line Road. Uh, this is a road that literally is on the county line where the southern portion is in Pasco, the northern portion is in Hernando. Portions of the road exist, but there are portions that still need to be completed. And the portions that are currently there are very much over capacity with the growth that the county has been experiencing. So that covers the changes to the priority list. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, otherwise, we are seeking a recommendation of approval or a vote of approval from this board today. And we can take both of the lists as one uh, if that pleases the board. Of course. Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. You okay with this list, Whit? I can't hear you. Yes, I no, am. No, I said, are you, I said to Witt, is he okay with this list? I am list? okay with this list, yes. We worked. You know, I just, I mean, and I'm not complaining, and I'm not there. I have been there before. You're there on our behalf. I just never see anything in Pinellas on this list. And I, it's not a complaint. I mean, it's just not a lot of Pinellas stuff. It's a lot of, and I, I just pointed out. Well, the uh, Gateway Expressway has yes. long been no, a priority I know. here, I and know that's that. about to open uh, soon, right, Brian? <laughs> soon no, but I mean, if you look at the length of the list, yeah, and there's not a lot of Pasco there either. I, I'm just saying, and I understand the um, geographical challenge where when we're all traveling, we're going a lot of times in a certain direction, so we need the things that are going on in Tampa. Mm -hmm. I'm just making a call out. It's not a complaint. Well, l let me explain a little bit about how the list is put together. And um, Chelsea, feel free to chime, chime in. 
But essentially, we're looking for projects that we, first of all, are really well-defined projects. And there's an exception or two on here, but for the most part, these are projects that are ready to go. They're just lacking funding. They've kind of gone through the process. They've been vetted at a certain level, but now we need to kind of advocate for, for the dollars to, to flow to the project. And a good example of that is the West Shore Interchange. And I think that's Commissioner Egger's favorite project in, 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 in history. Um, because he's proud of the fact that he made the motion, Pinellas led the way of making that the number one priority in the region, and it's not in our county, because it is such a regionally significant project. Mm -hmm. The one project on here that's maybe not super well defined is regional passenger rail transit connecting Tampa and Orlando. Um, you know, that's the bright line extension to bring it over to Tampa. But that's, you know, a project that is in the works, and I think it's important for the region to signal that there's regional support yeah. for that project, too. Um, I feel like we've gotten a lot out of this regional list. Um, certainly, the Sun Runner was a key part, and it was important that Hillsborough County and Pasco County recognize the Sun Runner as a regional asset. Uh, and then the, um, I mentioned the Gateway Expressway, and then we're really happy that the FDOT approved the I-275 uh, express lanes down to 38th Avenue North. That's not the full project. So we have another bite at the apple to get that all the way down to 54th Avenue South. Um, so I feel pretty good about it, but it is one of those things that if we do form a regional MPO, we're gonna continue to have those kinds of discussions of making sure geographic equity is, is considered. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have comments into this particular piece of the conversation? Anybody? Okay, so I do. Sure. That's what I wanted to know if anybody else said anything. We spend a lot of time talking about the east-west connection going over to Hillsborough County. But if, if any of you have traveled up to Pasco County or even more importantly down to Manatee, which we hardly ever discuss, it is like bees in a beehive trying to move around on the other side of the Skyway Bridge. Same thing if you go up to Pasco County with the incredible growth up there. And, you know, it used to be after you got off the Skyway, it was miles and miles of open land undeveloped. But if you go down there now, it's all being developed with residential <coughs> housing. And I struggle in my mind to wonder who's working on that transportation plan because I have sat, when we had T. Barta, there were representatives there from Manatee. We had representatives from Pasco. But I don't see much emphasis in the discussions we have about the connection going north and south. Are we worried about that at all? I'd just like to hear your comments. Sure. Uh, I think it's important. Uh, the Skyway Bridge um, is operating generally at an acceptable level, but I agree with you on the approaches south and north. We do have some operational issues. So when I mentioned the I-275 project, one of our priorities uh, is to have that all the way down to 54th Avenue South, which will help some of the operational issues getting off the Skyway into downtown St. Petersburg. In the morning, there can be backups. Except for once you get over the Skyway, right. then it's a log jam down there. Right. Manatee County does not have much of a transportation network in the north part of the county, so everything funnels onto a few roads. Uh, they are widening roads like Moccasin Wallow Road, which was a two-lane road forever. It's going to be a six-lane road. Um, so the Sarasota Manatee MPO does cover that area, and they are part of the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance. So we do have a forum for us to talk about those issues, and uh, they are keenly uh, aware of the primary work trip destination for a lot of the Manatee County residents that are moving into Manatee County is either Hillsborough or Pinellas County. It's a quick 25, 30 minute trip into St. Petersburg from northern Manatee County. So yes, we, we are concerned about it. We will be working together on our long range transportation plans with the Sarasota Manatee MPO and with the Hillsboro and with Pasco to advance projects that deal with that. And you'll, you'll hear from the Florida Department of Transportation in a few months about our plans to work on US 19 North into Pasco County um, to, to facilitate improvements in that connection as well. And south as well, I hope. We will be looking, taking that up in the long range plan as well, sure. Okay, putting it on the radar <laughs> for future discussion. I, 
Yep. Mayor. It's hard to get so you know. southbound in Manatee County to Bradenton and Palmetto. You for better sure. believe it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you. And this is an action item. I'm sorry? This is an action item. Okay, let me put my cheaters back on so I know where I am here. Okay, so do we have a motion for uh, item 7C? Move approval. I'll second. It's been moved by uh, Mayor Boljowski and seconded by Commissioner Scott. All those in favor, please designate by saying aye. 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 Okay, on Madam to Chair, may I interrupt to point out that there were no citizens wishing to be heard on this matter, just for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Now on to item 7D, acceptance of plan and approval of recommendations on Advantage Alt-19. The action presentation is going to be given by Jared Schneider and Kimley Horn. Before, Where's your partner? <laughs> I've got one partner over there, one listening online as well. So. And I'll, uh, before Jared, you get started, I just want to acknowledge that Christina Mendoza of our staff was our project manager for this effort. And her last day was, what, Monday? Yeah. So um, she is now on her way to Boston, uh, where she's relocated with her husband, uh, to go work for the U.S. Department of Transportation. And we're going to really miss her. But she did a great job managing this project. And I really want to thank Kimley Horn also for, for being very responsive to the local governments and working through all the issues uh, that we had, um, just as we always do with the diversity of our cities along the corridor in the county. Boston, so she's going to fix all the issues with the big dig? Um, I think <laughs> she's going to be more nationally focused on, on issues. Good to know. Yeah. Okay. Did you well, wait, you beat me there? to the punch. I was, I was going to thank Christina as well. So thanks for, for mentioning that. Christina Mendoza is key. She will, she will be with the Federal Transit Authority, so maybe we'll have some connections there. I also want to thank Rodney, Chapman, and staff from Fort Pinellas. I also see a lot of the local staffs here today as well. Uh, City of St. Pete, City of Seminole, Pinellas County, Clearwater, Largo, we're, we're all, this was really a collaborative joint effort, so really thankful for them as well as PSTA and FDOT. So today just wanted to kind of show you a, a brief update on the study. I know you've seen components of it in the past, provide the complete study overview, and a, a little bit on the next steps on where we're going. Um, just to back up a little bit, inv the investment corridor strategy has been something we've been talking about for a number of years so from the last Advantage Pinellas Long Range Transportation Plan. Identified on the map on the right are those investment corridors. And, and really what the All-19 corridor does is it connects the Sunrunner line and creates a spine from the city of St. Pete, Seminole, uh, again, unincorporated county, Largo, up to Clearwater. So it's a significant corridor and connection um, the investment corridor strategy, the purpose was really to focus as we grow as a county with 50 or 60,000 projected in the next 20, 30 years, really focused in these corridors and focusing our infrastructure investment in these corridors as well. Also identified were already high uh, transit ridership corridors. So alternate 19 has some transit routes, uh, the Route 18, that's the second highest ridership in the entire county. The purpose is really to guide. Again, guide redevelopment infrastructure development is happening, so it's, it's to get, get out ahead of the growth. I can remember moving to the Bay Area 20 years ago, and, and we were, uh, Commissioner Driscoll, you might like this, um, and other St. Pete, I, I remember talking about Central Avenue and what that could look like, <coughs> and now just see what, what's happening. So again, why all 19? It's a strategic location, and we've highlighted some of the stats here. Um, within this quarter, within a half mile, we have over 70,000 people, which is uh, over what is in Pinellas Park for, for context. It's 30,000 employees. We've got um, several high ridership corridors that cross um, Alternate 19, five activity centers, uh, again, three other investment corridors. I uh, already mentioned second highest ridership. Um, multiple modes, what we're really trying to do is connect people to jobs, to job education, housing. Nobody's talking about that right now, right? So that's, that's a significant portion of this as well. And also two SPS campuses on the corridor. So I just highlighted a little bit there, that's the corridor again in, in context in that purple dashing. And then also wanted to talk about this, I think Ford Pinellas staff, uh, Jared Austin and others have done a fantastic job 
on creating kind of the multimodal uh, index. And this is really interesting where you can see how Alt-19 just pops up the map. And, and what that means, that what the index does is it looks at the propensity of what's out there today from transit or multimodal infrastructure. So again, it's, it's already creating. You can kind of see how Central Avenue and Alternate 19 just light up. So to get into the components of the plan, it's pretty comprehensive. As, as you probably saw, there's five main sections. I won't go over a lot of the existing conditions you've already seen. If you really want to get into the details, there's several appendices that will be forthcoming as well. Um, today, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the redevelopment vision and the recommendations itself. Again, for context, this is the, the study area. What we did is we split the corridor into four main sections. They're, they're all different. There's different contexts. There's similarities, but there's also differences. Um, for context as well, this is a 16-mile long corridor with the Pinellas Trail, so it's pretty, pretty lengthy. There was a lot of community engagement. We did a great job Chris, uh, talking about Christina. It was really instrumental and other Ford Pinellas staff that are here today. There was a variety of opportunities to gain a range of voices. We had online engagement, in-person engagement. We went to the city of Largo and went to the touch a truck event. I, I think my hearing has still gone bad from all the trucks that were honking. Uh, we had virtual surveys. So there was, there was a range of just different opportunities. Uh, to provide input, as well as significant one-on-one -on -one meetings with city staff and county staff. This lays out the corridor vision, and, and really what it's highlighting is, is the opportunity for enhanced transit along the corridor, those east-west connections. Again, this, this serves as a spine. In the, the purple, we've highlighted activity nodes, and, and what, we, what we mean by that is even along the 16-mile corridor, even if if it's a redevelopment focus area, and I'll, I'll remind you all, this is a, a redevelopment and a transit strategy, but the focus is on some of these major nodes. There's 14 potential station areas that we identified that could be looked at uh, moving forward. So I'm gonna transition a little bit now into the transit piece. There's two major phases that were identified as part of the transit vision. And really the way we've been talking about this and looking at this is having a two-part strategy. Having a short-term strategy where we could look at limited stop, high-frequency express bus, and really test it out at eight major hubs. We've got those identified on the right of that map. And so what that means is enhanced service every 30 minutes along this corridor. And really try it out. That could also include other type of technology such as intersection improvements, transit signal priority, um, and queue jump lanes. And, and I'll note that also helps in a, a lot of cases we see around the country that helps with traffic flow as well. So again, it's just kind of limited stop. Um, and then the long term, really looking at high capacity bus service, branded high frequency. Someone, I won't say this, but someone coined it as a Sunrunner light. Uh, you could have buses in exclusive lanes. We know that that, you know, that always comes up, right? What, what happens when we do that? So that would include, there would need to be additional study, obviously, on that for a possibility of exclusive conditional or, or uh, bus lane usage. But essentially, it's, it's taking it to the next step where you'd have additional BRT stations along the corridor, and we've got those identified uh, on the right. And this all links in with the redevelopment strategy as well. So again, linking what our mission here at Fort Pinellas is linking land use to transportation. So on that note, we've identified station area place types. This builds off of the Sunrunner Rising study. It's consistent with, with those station area place types. And, and really, what, what is a place type? What it means is not every place is the same. There's different characteristics. But it, it guides the vision that we heard from the community and, and what the look and the feel, the, the building heights, the massing of the buildings could look like in these, these different areas. So you'll see there's a downtown, which is Clearwater, urban village, and, and neighborhood. This gives you a little bit of flavor for each of those place types, those 14 nodes that I just shared with you. There's, we take a deep dive on station area profiles and identify what's the redevelopment vision? What's the, what's the potential over time? Again, trying to guide that growth. And mobility recommendations and, and other infrastructure improvements 
are also identified. So this is a, a map of downtown uh, Largo and, and showing some of those opportunities. This is another little preview where we also had uh, HRNA, who's a national leader in market research, on the team, and they identified potential market gaps in the area. Really what rose to the top is, no surprise again, housing, uh, food, beverage, as, as well as office. So we had kind of identified that for each station area where those lo locations could be. And then on the right, we shared again, it's, it's getting people to the stations is so important that we're all working on. So we identified some of those improvements that could roll into the long range transportation plan. I will note just because on the map we show high potential sites, that doesn't mean that could happen. The market's really gonna drive um, the potential. But again, I, I'll bring up the Central Avenue example. I think when we were doing maps like this 20 years ago, we are now seeing some of those high potential sites really come out. So to talk about implementation, right, it's, it's always about funding. So I, I highlight the short-term strategy, which is on the left map, um, and then on the right, we've also identified different types of funding from value capture, special assessments, grants, there's a number of grant opportunities, but really the, the purpose is to look at the short term, have a test case, see what works before we go to the long-term vision, and, and that helps guide uh, development, and then also it helps guide future uh, revenue and, and funding potential as well. Got to have that plan to go after federal and state dollars. Also, a big part of this plan um, was policy and regulatory. Uh, updates and, and recommendations, and then also mobility improvements. So we've highlighted this again, kind of these are the, what I wanted to talk about here, the major buckets of recommendations, the policies and regulations, which were tailored for each jurisdiction, but then we saw a lot of similarities. Again, housing came up over and over again. Uh, mobility improvements was a bucket, transit operations, and then how do all the cities uh, that Pinellas County partner together? Again, can't say enough, funding strategies were also identified that I, I think that's gonna be key moving forward. I think Rodney and I were, were throwing out uh, a Winston Churchill quote at some point, this is, this is really just the, the start. Um, we, had, we had the planning phase and now it's looking at um, really the, the next phases of design and implementation. Again, I'll kind of wrap up with what's next. The, the redevelopment vision, working towards the implementation will be a quarter-wide quarter and multi-step process. Um, PSDA is actively conducting the next phase, which is uh, called a Transit Concept and Alternatives Review, a TCAR study. And, and what that does is looks at the alternatives. It's, it's almost a pre-design type phase and looks at what could be feasible, what's possible. And again, that's essential to look at state and federal dollars, uh, also identifying the potential funding opportunities for the, for the next phases as well. Also, Largo is actively looking at policy and regulatory updates, so they're already taking and carrying forward a lot of the, the land use recommendations from the study and, and moving those, those forward. So with that, we'll, we'll take any questions and appreciate your time today, and thanks again. Before you all ask questions of Jared, I just wanted to point out, you mentioned that the PSTA is moving forward with the Transit Corridor Alternatives Review Study. Uh, that'll be presented to the PSTA Planning Committee, I think on the 17th and then to the board on the 24th. Um, so just, there's a tie in there and we're coordinating well on that. And that process is required if we want the state to participate in any sort of future funding for this. Questions? Comments? No, you're awfully quiet today. And, and I'm sure you all read it and looked at it, but on your consent agenda was um, a line item authorizing us to work with Kimley Horn and the city of Largo to begin advancing some of the recommendations on the policy level within the city of Largo. All right. So, um, do we have any proponents or opponents, Tina, on this issue? Madam Chair, there are no citizens wishing to be heard on this item. All right. May I have a, a motion to approve? Move approval. It is an afternoon. It is an afternoon. Yep. 
Yeah, we are, we are, we are seeking the board's uh, action on this one to uh, accept the planning study and approve the recommendations. And again, uh, this does not commit us to building anything just yet. Uh, what it does is it keeps us moving down the path and uh, we'll incorporate this into our long range transportation plan. Madam Chair, if the board will indulge, Sharon Calvert has asked to speak on the item. Sure, come on up, uh, Sharon. And did we have a second? I didn't catch it. I'm sorry? Did we have a second on that motion yet? I didn't catch who it was. I Thanks. thought we'd, David, over here. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Please continue. Uh, yes, hi, I'm Sharon Cal Calvert again. I live in Tierra Verde. Um, <clears throat> watching this, I have a grave concern about this project, especially from a PSDA perspective. PSDA's finances, as we all know, are an issue. I mean, if you looked at their budget two years from now, they're showing again to be insolvent. So, uh, you know, spending a whole lot of time on a project that, to me, could be financially risky is, uh, and spending taxpayer money on it, I have a grave concern about it. And as, and as far as uh, a short term, why didn't you do a short term on 34th Street or, the, or Pasadena Avenue? You could have used traffic signalization there um, and stopped, you know, eliminated having to take the lanes away there. So um, that's just a concern of mine. And once this gets out into the public about a long-term strategy of possibly removing lanes away, I think you're going to get pushed back. So you need to take that into consideration. Because I didn't hear any questions from any of the board members about anything. And this is a huge project that will impact all of Pinellas County. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, I have um, Council Member Gerard as the motion and Council Member Albright as the second. Good. Mr. Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So just to uh, clarify, uh, with this, this doesn't commit us to anything. This is we're just accepting the plan and. That's right. Uh, we, we see viable, uh, again, as Jared pointed out, this is one of the highest ridership quarters right. in, in the county. This is a lot more of a redevelopment plan than it is just a transit plan. Right. Um, but we feel like there needs to be something that goes with that. If we're increasing density and intensity within this corridor because the market's there, and we're seeing all these people moving to Florida and moving to Pinellas County, where are they gonna go? You know, we're projecting another 120,000 residents in this county uh, by the year 2050. So these corridors are really good places, we think, because they're already kind of disturbed earth. There's a lot of retail uh, and commercial uses that are underutilized, um, uh, and, and that could be converted as part of redevelopment. The short-term strategy is a relatively low-cost strategy. And, um, and, you know, we're going to have to have those conversations with PSTA about how we look at budgeting their resources and, and putting them into um, different places to make things work. Um, but I also feel that uh, the Department of Transportation has given us more flexibility with some of the funding sources. So, for instance, there's a new program, uh, and I know I'm getting into the weeds here, called District Dedicated Revenue, which they've enabled to be used for transit operations over like a five-year period, and it's a declining scale. So you'll start out in year one, they might pay for 100% of that. By year five, it's down to 20%, and then it's on us. If the service works well, then we continue that service. If it doesn't work well, then we have a conversation at that point. The long-term plan that Ms. Calvert mentioned would only come after much more extensive community engagement, after proven success of this first phase. I mean, I wouldn't want to go to that next level if this first didn't work. And then we would certainly go through with a lot of public outreach and technical analysis. Right. Yep. No, I appreciate that. I, I mean, I like this plan because it's a walk before we run kind of thing. And this is a, a planning document. I just want to make that point that it's not committing us to anything. It's This is going to be evolve over time. That's right. Right. Thanks. Did you have something, Mayor? I did. Yeah, um, please. I just wanted to say, you know, we didn't ask any questions because we've been looking at this for quite some time. It's not something new that we're just seeing. But I, I also think, Gina, and I know Commissioner Scott, you guys are sitting on PSTA. I sat on PSTA for nine years. Every other year they were going over their reserves, and every other year when they get to that budget, they're fine. This is just the way they look at a budget. Am I correct? They just try to show how we have to be how the organization has to be um, 
you know, conservative. I'm not saying it should be that way, but you're correct. I'm not saying it should be that way either, but I'm just saying I don't think PSDA is going to be insolvent. That, that you know, I, I just didn't. But I also think it's an important point for you all to make to the other PSTA folks that this is what the public is seeing and maybe they should consider reworking how they show the budget to the community because it never happens, but they do show that. Um, and also, I think it's important, and I'll say it again, I say it all the time. I think these corridors are the way we should look at things, but I think in tandem, you'll agree with me, Commissioner Scott, we have to look at how many cars are on the road from tourism, and we have to work on getting those cars off the road. At the same time, we are looking at doing these kinds of projects that can cost millions. I think it it's prudent because I will say it again, 5.5 million extra cars a year are on our road because of tourism. That's never going away unless we create solid transit services that get them off the road. And that, that will help these constrained corridors to some degree and maybe help us spend less in those areas. But I, I just need to say that to remind all of us who are working towards better transit in, in our county. Thank you. Anybody else have anything to offer? Questions, concerns, thoughts? I would just like to go on the record to say many years ago, and I've been involved for a very long time, and I think it was through Forward Pinellas, so Whit, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I had the opportunity to, to attend, it was either a two or a three day um, workshop or whatever you wanna call it, on transportation funding. And I don't know if all of you have been through that little exercise that's put on, I think I'm correct, by the University of South Florida. Mm -hmm. I found it fascinating, and while transportation budgets and all that thing are not necessarily my forte, I do think as public officials, elected officials, it's really, really important to get your arms around how transportation funding for big projects like this move forward. And it does not happen in a one or two year time frame. The process is incredibly lengthy because the steps that you have to go through at the federal level to complete all of their requirements to pull down federal money to match local funds is unbelievable. And because I did have the very fortunate experience of serving on PSTA for as long as I did, I really began to understand those steps and what was required and how long it took to go from step one to step two. And at some point along the way, we had this really magnificent visual chart that showed, it was like a staircase, and it showed all of the requirements of step one to get to step two and then all of the requirements in step two to get to step three. I don't know whatever I did with that chart because it has followed me forever, but I'm constantly reminding myself of it and trying to find it because I found it so valuable. So if you produced that or PSTA did or whatever, I would encourage you all to get your hands on it and really commit it to your to your decision making when we're looking at transportation funding. Because without that knowledge, you have the kind of comments we get from our citizens who haven't had the luxury of going through that kind of educational process. But it's complicated and not easy. And the requirements are very stringent. So just so you know, I thought that was important to put out there again. At the beginning of the year, as we start going through some of these things that are so critical, not for today, but for the future of who comes behind us. 
our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids. Okay, I'll stop. Okay, on to. Um, well, we still need to take action. Oh, I thought we just did. No. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, all those in favor, please aye. designate aye. by saying aye. All right, now we are on 7E, Advantage Pinellas Housing Action Plan Update. Linda? Hello. Hello. Um, so thank you. This is our second update to the board on implementation of a housing action plan. Uh, this is a countywide. Hey, is your mic on? I can barely hear you. Is this better? Yes. Very much so. Thank okay. you. Um, okay, so this is a countywide effort to implement the Advantage Pinellas Housing Compact, which is being jointly led by Forward Pinellas and Pinellas County. Um, but this board is the entity that is overseeing the action plan. Um, we committed to you in November that staff would come before you every other month with an update on implementation of the plan. Some of these updates will be progress reports on projects that we're working on. Some will be guest presentations from local governments or private and nonprofit stakeholders to give their perspective and talk about what they're doing at the local level. And then some of these will be informational briefings focusing on one particular subject that you've told us that you want to know more about. And when we talked in November, uh, one of the topics you highlighted was accessory dwelling units or ADUs. So for our first briefing, we're going to talk about ADUs today. Um, but before we get to that, I wanted to just give you a, a very brief update on the four implementation projects that we're currently working on. Um, the first is a housing educational campaign. We are working with Pinellas County Marketing and Communications to begin developing a coordinated outreach and media strategy to give our local government and community partners the tools they need to make the case for housing affordability and why we need it in each community. Um, we're working on this together with our tactical team of staff from several partner local governments, and we'll be tying it in to local affordable housing efforts so that we're all speaking the same message. And our goal is to bring you an outline of that effort at your next bi-monthly update in March. The second project is the countywide housing target study that's being led by Pinellas County Housing and Community Development. And this study will help us identify where we have the greatest need for creating and preserving affordable housing units, um, what income sectors, ages, and uh, types of households have the greatest needs, and where we can best apply the resources that we have. And we expect that study to be complete in the second quarter of 2024. Another project underway is the creation of online mapping and analysis tools to help us coordinate planning for housing with transit, uh, healthy communities, resilience, and so forth. And uh, we will make these tools publicly available so that any local government or anyone in the community can use them. Um, we expect to complete that project in the first quarter of this year. Um, but there's one part of it that we want to highlight first. And that is our Live Local dashboard, which will track developments built countywide under the Live Local Act. And uh, my colleague, Jared Austin, will give you a demonstration of that, of that dashboard, we hope, next month. And then the last of our current implementation projects is an affordable housing regulatory toolkit. Um, it will create a, a menu of regulatory strategies and incentives that any community can use. Um, again, that will be uh, done in partnership with the local governments and their own local efforts. We are getting ready to select a consultant and kick this project off. And our target is the third quarter of this year. So um, before I go on, are there any questions about these updates? Anybody? Commissioner Driscoll. Thank you. Um, when you were talking about the dashboard, you said it was going to track um, countywide projects. Uh, built under the Live Local Act. Right. So would that include um, all development, including private, and not just that, that is um, utilizing county funds? That's correct. And we're working with all your local government staff to help us find and, and track these projects. Great. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Gerard. Uh, this may be out of, out of order of the presentation, but... Um, I sit on the advisory council for the area agency on aging, Pasco Pinellas, and uh, at every meeting we are uh, 
We received reports on the, uh, the housing insecurity of seniors in both counties. Uh, our helpline received over 2,000 calls last year from seniors who are experiencing housing in, uh, insecurity. Uh, several hundred have already become homeless as a result. So I would ask that as we, as we move forward, that if we can break out a category or just pay attention to the uh, situation among seniors, 80% of seniors right now are extremely financially stressed in their housing in the county. So if we could just pay attention to that and, and stay aware and maybe whatever we might be able to do to help alleviate that or address those, is those issues. Thank you for that, and we agree that that is a, a very critical issue, and that's one of the things that we'll be looking at in the uh, countywide housing target study is the age brackets of the different households and what their different needs are. Okay. All right, so now I'll move on to our informational briefing on accessory dwelling units. Um, so we mentioned them and encouraged them specifically in the housing action plan as part of the goal to create greater diversity and choice in market rate housing. Um, ADUs are defined by statute. Uh, they have to be secondary to a primary dwelling unit. They have to have a separate kitchen, bathroom, and sleeping area. And they can be either attached or detached relative to the main dwelling. Um, the typical type of ADUs we see locally are uh, second story apartments located over detached garages in older neighborhoods, uh, usually uh, facing alleys. But they come in all different configurations, and you'll see some different examples on these slides. So why would you want ADUs in your community? Um, well, they serve some unique roles. Um, first and foremost, they just provide more housing options in single family neighborhoods and more places to live generally, and smaller and lower cost options while still fitting into the neighborhood character. Um, they're also very useful for extended family households. Uh, an adult child or an elderly parent can live independently but still be close to the family. And they can also serve as a source of income for homeowners. Most existing ADUs tend to be found in traditional neighborhoods that were built before World War II. Uh, those are the neighborhoods with alleys, typically, and they tend to have a greater number and variety of housing units overall. Um, but ADUs can also fit in within suburban neighborhoods. Um, they would typically have to be entered from the front of the property rather than a rear alley, and they would need to be compatible with the suburban neighborhood character. Um, so that's really the first question you need to answer. If you want to allow ADUs in your communities, what locations do you want to allow them in, and how do they need to be designed to fit in? Now we have some constraints here in Florida because state law limits what kinds of design requirements you can adopt for single family or two family um, dwellings. You can't mandate architectural style, the location of the garage, the roof pitch, etc. But you can regulate height, bulk, orientation, and location of a dwelling on a lot, and you can require buffering and visual screening. So you do have some tools to work with. It's also, <clears throat> it's also important to make sure that the scale of the units and the lots they sit on are compatible with the neighborhood. Now, some communities tend to err on the side of caution and only allow ADUs on very large lots. Um, a neighborhood might have a typical lot size of 6,000 square feet, but an ADU might require a minimum of 10,000 square feet by code. And that excludes the majority of the lots in that neighborhood. That's a really common regulatory hurdle um, so if your community wants to encourage ADUs, you'll just want to make sure that your minimum lot sizes are realistic to the areas where you want them to go. Um, minimum and maximum unit sizes are another important consideration. If the minimum sizes are too large or the maximum sizes are too small, either of those can create a disincentive to build ADUs. And the Florida Housing Coalition recommends allowing a minimum size of 300 square feet and a maximum size of 800 to 1,200 square feet, depending on the context and scale of your neighborhood. Another major issue is parking. Um, typically, communities will require one off-street parking space to be provided per ADU, um, but it's important to allow flexibility for where that parking can be located on site, and not to require it to be strictly in a garage or a driveway. 
And some communities will actually waive the, the off-street parking requirement entirely in areas where on-street parking is available and particularly where uh, an area is well served by transit. So that provides some additional flexibility that helps encourage these units to be built. Uh, and then there's just the issue of density. Strict application of a unit per acre density standard is another element that can inadvertently prohibit ADUs from being allowed to be built. Now in the countywide rules, ADUs are not counted against density, so that is an option that your local governments have. Um, the rationale is that typically only a fraction of homeowners are ever gonna build ADUs, and their impacts can be regulated through other, these other standards that we've talked about, and they meet a public purpose. So we've traditionally been comfortable with that exemption in the rules. And then the approval process can make a big difference. If each individual ADU requires a public hearing, that adds time and uncertainty in the process, to the process, which can be a major disincentive. And it also creates more opportunities for neighbors to potentially come out and object to individual ADUs. So allowing them by right is the best way to encourage them. But if that's not something that works for your community, then making the requirements for approval as simple and predictable as possible is also very beneficial. So those are the basic regulatory elements to consider, but of course there are also some challenges. And this is the biggest question right now. How do we prevent ADUs from turning into vacation rentals? Uh, since state law preempts many of our communities from, from prohibiting them, um, well, a potential way to do that is to offer the property owner a financial incentive, uh, such as waiving an impact fee in return for a deed restriction that prevents the use of the unit as a vacation rental and carries penalties for violating that. Alternatively, there's more of a coexistent strategy of requiring one of the structures on the site to be owner-occupied. Um, so it could be either the main unit or the ADU. Um, that doesn't prevent vacation rentals from happening, but it does mitigate the impacts of things like noise and excess parking, since the owner is right there to enforce the rules. Now, even if those impacts are mitigated, an ADU being used as a vacation rental, of course, is not contributing to housing affordability. But every ADU isn't gonna be used that way, and allowing more ADUs generally means that more housing options will become available, even if it's not 100% of the units. So there isn't a perfect answer here, but there are some things that can be done. Another potential issue is neighborhood concerns. Um, where are the new residents gonna park? Are they gonna bring down property values? Is it gonna bring in crime? Those are the typical um, questions and concerns that we hear when uh, neighbors oppose increases in density. But I have to say that I was pleasantly surprised when I gave this presentation to our Planners Advisory Committee last week um, I asked them about what kinds of opposition they're seeing, and the answer was there's not really that much. For the communities that allow ADUs, um, their residents who live in the neighborhoods where they're allowed are already used to living with them and don't find them intrusive. Now, the majority of existing ADUs, again, are in those traditional neighborhoods where they've always been, and to the extent that communities start allowing them in new areas and more suburban areas, then um, community opposition to them might increase. But in that case, the best thing that we can do is just to educate residents as much as possible, highlight the examples where ADUs are coexisting already, and encourage uh, residents of those neighborhoods to speak up. So summing up what we've talked about, if your community wants to encourage ADUs, uh, the best incentives are to reduce regulatory barriers wherever possible, allow them in a broad variety of locations, allow some kind of streamlined approval process, and consider using fee waivers, which again can give you more leverage uh, over how the properties can be used. Um, lastly, I will bring it full circle and talk about how ADUs fit into the four implementation projects I mentioned at the beginning. Um, we will include model regulations and incentives for ADUs in our regulatory toolkit um, we'll talk about how to address neighborhood concerns as part of our housing educational campaign. Data from the countywide housing target study will be used to help inform ADU policy. And then our online mapping and analysis tools will help guide local decision making for where they should go. 
And that is my presentation. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, Mayor Bajowski. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, we have wrestled with the ADU. It, this is really just comments, not questions. We've wrestled with the whole ADU thing. We're a small community. We're only 10 square miles, but we're the fifth largest city. We have a unique um, sort of spread of neighborhoods. You know, on the north side of our city, we have kind of all the suburban sprawl that the 70s, 80s, and 60s even brought to us in 90s. Um, on the south side, we have a lot of older homes, um, some of which, you know, have the apartment above the garage kind of thing. And I don't know, any number of years ago, 15 years ago, maybe, we, we did classify ADUs, that type of thing, but we said that, yeah, literally worried about this that far ago, which it wasn't even a thing 15 years ago. But worried about this kind of thing, we, we in our rules, it, it literally says you have to be related. This was kind of during the, um, the recession when you had a lot of college kids moving back home and then you had parents living with their families because everybody was sort of consolidating. So it's kind of why we did that. And for, for several years now, people are asking, can we convert these to regular ADUs? But in our city, in every spot that can be done, people are, we have a, it's better now, but we have had a deluge of short-term rentals. And we have really, I'm gonna tell you, until that piece can get solved, we're not opening up that door. Because it, it just adds to a problem we already have. And I hate to say that because affordable housing is really, really important to us. We're looking to invest our own money into projects. Um, we've even looked at where ADUs could be, like where there's enough space on a property to actually, if you were going to build it and it wasn't there. So we know it's not a huge amount, but even adding it there, it just, it, it adds the opportunity of short-term rentals in our R60 neighborhoods. And right now we have enough regulation that keeps it out of our R60. Mm -hmm. And we just don't want to open up that door until other things change. I just wanted to share that. I appreciate that. And that is the number one concern that we're hearing with ADUs. So that's definitely something that we're going to look further into as we, uh, as we build our regulatory toolkit. So is, is that a, excuse me, Gina, is that issue something that can be solved by more, more adequately defining short-term rental and what that means? It's about the state um, letting us regulate our own stuff. That's really what it's about. And I mean, I have to tell you, I'm not against short-term rentals. I never have been. We were one of the lucky cities that were able to define the areas we wanted them in. And we picked kind of what you would call touristy areas. And we zoned it that way. Um, and trust me, they've taken over those areas. We're just not allowing them in our R60 neighborhoods or multifamily neighborhoods. Um, but even with us, who I feel like we've done it the right way, we're not getting overrun, we cannot stop somebody from doing the ADU thing. It's a co we, have, we have three code people with the, that are trying to enforce this stuff and they can't keep up with it. We've had to spend money on programs that track them online. I mean, it's, it's getting the state to allow us to regulate what the zoning and what's allowed in our city on our own. That's what it is, and it's never gonna happen. Never say never. True. Um, Commissioner Driscoll. Thank you, and um, thank you, Mayor, for, for the comments, and uh, I think no matter what city you're from in Pinellas County, we can all agree that um, short-term rentals is something that we uh, collectively hope that the state will um, help us help ourselves on. Yes. Um, but getting back to ADUs, I just wanted to um, share that St. Petersburg has had um, has made some really great progress over the last several years with ADUs in our city, but we didn't do all of this at once. And it was probably five 
years ago, maybe six years ago, that we we took one step. This was when I started on city council. This is one of the first uh, things that I did in regards to ADUs um, was I was part of the uh, vote to reduce the minimum lot size, and that's all we did. There wasn't, um, you know, not a. It was a major change in that it really we saw an increase in the number of permits uh, that were pulled for ADUs just by going from 5,400 square feet to um, 4,800 square foot lots. So um, that made a, a difference, and I think you had mentioned like 10,000 as a as a minimum somewhere. That was just a hypothetical example. Like, where are those magical places left in? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we so we started with that, and um, today I was just looking at it like I don't have the numbers for 2023 yet, but um, in 2017 we had 23 permits pulled for ADUs, and in. 2022 so five years later we had 86 and we've we've made more changes since then to make it easier um, I personally worked with city staff to uh, create a page on our website uh, kind of a, a one-stop shop for finding out how how you would go about it whether or not you can put one on your property because we require things like alley access and all that stuff um but it's but just helping people understand it better there's been a great interest so to see that number jump like that over the years since we've made incremental changes and fine-tuned things as we go uh, we found something that really worked for our city so if if you if you look at one piece of that if if you wanted to dip your toe in i would highly recommend going about it that way rather than taking on everything at once because it's not, you can't do a cookie cutter approach with this. Thank you. Anyone else for the good of the order on this issue? Anyone? Gina, do we have anyone from the audience that wishes to speak on this issue? Commissioner Mike Eisner would like to speak if that's okay with you, Madam Chair. It's not an action item, so it's not required for citizens, but he did ask. All right, well, come forward, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. <clears throat> I tend to agree with you, Mayor. Um, we have the similar problem. Um, we have one code enforcement person, and that person has roller skates. Um, when you give people the opportunity sometimes to break rules and regulations, they do. Um, I do have locations that do have 10,000 square feet, so we are in that location. But I've also sat on the Board of Adjustments for six and a half years. And what we're finding is more and more people are um, trying to lean against setbacks because we're losing those large areas. So um, I, I think it could be something good in certain areas where you can set rules and regulations that you can follow. But unless you set up a another committee to follow suit and make sure that the people are um, following the rules and regulations, it just it just sets up a bad venue of, of more things that the police have to follow. So um, I think in the areas where you can monitor it, it's great. In the areas where you can't, um, one of the things I think I heard somebody say is about home rule being removed from us, and that's something uh, I, I think we want to keep what's grandfathered into Tarpon Springs. Uh, grandfathered in because I know if we change anything we lose our home rule so uh, I don't agree with going ahead with this unless um, unless it's very much needed so that's what I'd like to say and thank you for your time I appreciate that thank you uh, Commissioner Gerard uh, thank you uh, our um, AHAC has been discussing uh, ADUs for uh, three years now uh, and we are actually encouraging it in Largo or, or taking a positive attitude toward it. Uh, we have uh, Housing for All um, sessions where ADUs are discussed in, in length. Uh, 
I, I think some of the uh, possibilities of mitigating any concern about uh, uh, vacation rentals, which we're, we're not big fans of it in Largo, and we do have issues with those. Uh, one, it was already mentioned to require the property owner to uh, live in either the ADU or the main house. Uh, if you're the property owner living there, you're not going to uh, be happy if, you're, if your vacation renter is throwing wild parties and, and running up and down the street. Uh, also incentivizing to uh, contract not to uh, use it as a vacation rental is an approach. It was also mentioned that you're not going to see a, a stampede toward building ADUs. A lot of neighborhoods, a lot of developments have uh, deed restrictions that wouldn't allow it, and so that's going to cut down on the inventory. Uh, and there are others, there are others um, that that are just going to more or less keep it in line. Um, but for someone who takes a look at the the necessity or the desire for families to have their parents aging in place and not institutionalized, uh, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great opportunity to do that. Uh, I think we would all benefit by taking a look at it and saying, how can we make this work rather than why it won't work? I, I think that they are just uh, one ingredient in addressing the, the housing situations that we're facing and we're going to face even more in the future. So um, there are ways to approach this. We've actually looked at the uh, possibility of uh, creating standard plans that uh, somebody who wants an ADU can actually go to the city and have a pre-approved plan selected from a number of those. Instead of paying an architect, you know, a ton of money to do this, you've got, I think somebody used the word cookie cutter, but you've got a, a number of different plans that you can just, you know, purchase for maybe a couple of hundred bucks that are already pre-approved, and it just makes it, uh, it just makes it more feasible to do something like this. There are a lot of ways of approaching it, and I would, I would, uh, I would ask that that we take a look at it and say this is something that, you know, let's let's see if we can make this work and see how we can improve the area. So thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, just Linda, for your edification too, what we started finding is people that did have ADUs, you know, as all the prices started going up, they're not renting these things very affordable. They're going to the rent that it was before the rent started going up. You know, so I think... I get where we're going, and I think back in the day, the, the coveted apartment above the garage used to be the afford affordable place to go. They're outrageous what they're asking for those small little things now, whether they're vacation rentals or not. So I, uh, that's what we're seeing, just, just so that you know. Sure. Um, I did want to just mention quickly that there are there's a pair of bills that's been proposed that would uh, allow a complete property tax exemption for ADUs if you rent them out at an affordable rate, if you certify uh, that you're renting them out at 60% of the area and median income uh, or, or less, then you get 100% tax exemption on your ADU. So that's one way to encourage them to be rented more affordably. That's interesting. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, moving on to item 7F. Complete Streets Grants Program Awards. Kylie Simpson. Kyle. Good afternoon. Kyle Simpson with Board Pinellas. So as stated, I'm here today to talk about our Complete Streets Grant Program. Uh, so this is actually the eighth year that we've had this program uh, going on, and this year we were actually able to increase the funding we had available um, from 100 to 150,000 for concept planning and from one million to one and a half million for construction projects. Uh, the focus of this, plan, this program has always been uh, safety for vulnerable roadway users, as well as trying to tie in transformative land use change uh, in the project corridors uh, where these uh, projects happen. Uh, so this year on the concept planning side, we received two applications, uh, one from Pinellas County for downtown Pulp Harbor on Florida Avenue, and one from the city of St. Petersburg uh, on 31st Street. Now we'll go into more detail. 
Uh, so in Palm Harbor, uh, their application was for a just under two tenth of a mile segment of West Florida Avenue. This is in between 8th Street and uh, Alt 19. Um, and the intention is to improve connectivity between uh, the park on the west side of the corridor and the Pinellas Trail, um, as well as add 60 to 65 parking spaces in the existing grass median of Florida Avenue. Um, on Florida Avenue, there's an existing uh, four-foot shoulder that kind of functions as a bike lane, but it's not marked as one. Um, and there are sidewalks that exist on both sides. Um, and just to note that this uh, complements their um, downtown Palm Harbor streetscape and parking strategic action plan that was adopted in last year. Um, and this project is not within a community redevelopment area or an environmental justice area. It's just a rendering that was included with the application that shows the Florida Avenue corridor uh, and what the median could look like with angled parking as well as uh, new landscaping. The second application we received for planning funds was from St. Petersburg, um, 31st Street, um, and this is just under four and a half miles from First Avenue North all the way down to Pinellas Point Drive. Uh, this goes through multiple districts within the city, um, including the South St. Pete CRA. Um, and this would focus on how to uh, improve safety for all roadway users, but especially people biking and walking either along 31st Street or getting across it. Uh, the city has documented uh, excessive speeding that happens in this corridor, um, so they'd look to address that. Um, and just noting that most of the corridor is within uh, an environmental justice area. On the construction side, this year we received one application from St. Pete for uh, curb extensions in the Grand Central District. Uh, so this would add curb extensions um, uh, at non-signalized intersections uh, within the Grand Central District uh, at 21st, 23rd, and 27th Streets. Uh, this would help implement the Grand Central District Master Plan, uh, and the purpose is to improve pedestrian safety and comfort. Um, a few years ago, um, concrete curb extensions were added at 24th, 25th, and 26th streets, and the city saw favorable uh, outcomes to that in terms of pedestrian safety, uh, lower um, excessive vehicular speeds, as well as um, just a better environment to support the local businesses um, in the corridor. And the city noted that uh, they would uh, intend to install painted ball bouts uh, with flex post as an interim measure um, to help kind of get some of the benefit um, while they wait for the capital funding to come through. And just also highlighting that Central Avenue is on St. Pete's high injury network. Um, so that means there's more crashes on Central Avenue um, than the other quote unquote normal roads in the city. Um, and as I said previously, it's uh, an opportunity to not only provide uh, landscaping, including shade trees. As we know, live oaks are wonderful, but their roots need a lot of space. Um, so if we uh, have more space to do a proper tree well, um, we can have success with that. Um, and this project is located within the South St. Pete CRA, in-town activity center, and two environmental justice areas. Um, so when looking at these applications, we form a review subcommittee um, comprised of members from our technical coordinating committee and our planners advisory committee. Uh, those members met on November 13th, and they are recommending that uh, the 31st Street planning study and the Grand Central District curb extension projects received funding this year. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the Palm Harbor uh, application, and while they felt it was a good project and should move forward, that it didn't really fit the scope and intent of the Complete Streets program. So those recommendations were brought back to the full TCC and the Citizen Advisory Committee in December. Both of those are recommending uh, approval of those recommendations. And just to provide a little context, there was discussion on um, kind of the geographic concentration this year. Um, and so this is in your packet, but primarily I wanted to show over the life of this project, this uh, program, uh, we have really good geographic representation on this is our planning grants since 2017. So we've had uh, Tarpon Springs, Dunedin, Clearwater, um, Largo, Pinellas Park, and one in St. Petersburg. Uh, and again, this is in your packet, just all the individual projects, but on the construction side, uh, we also have good representation, including some projects that are 
going to construction very soon, like uh, Skinner Boulevard in Dunedin, St. Petersburg Drive, and Oldsmar, uh, and others. Uh, there was also some question on why we had so few applications this year, and so we reached out to some of our partners uh, and heard that it was primarily just a capacity issue on their part. There's a lot of funding that's come down um, through the Safe Streets and Roads for All program, as well as uh, Pinellas Park and Largo are currently doing uh, planning studies that we funded last year. Um, so we will continue to work with our local partners to make sure that this is a viable and uh, opportunistic program for them moving forward. <laughs> Uh, so with that, we're here to ask for your uh, blessing for the subcommittee's recommendations. Um, if they are approved, the planning funds would become available on July 1st of this year, uh, and the construction project will be added uh, to our unfunded multimodal priority project list, which is historically then added to the fifth year of the FDOP work program and the next cycle of that. Happy to answer any questions. Questions? Concerns? Thoughts? Okay, and that was an action plan. May I have a motion, please, to move this forward? Moved by Commissioner Scott. Second by Mohammed. Yes. Yes, Madam Chair, we do have. I see uh, David has raised his hand. Do you want to come up, please, David? Someone else on the list, Tina? Ms. Calvert as well, Madam Chair. Oh, okay. Sharon, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chair. David Ballard Guttis, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in the downtown uh, Palm Harbor area. This uh, complete street concept, I feel as though, is based on a deliberately blighted and deliberately run-down condition of uh, downtown Palm Harbor upon which to base this development upon. Uh, in that regards, I feel as though it's a staged event. Now, in order to fund these complete street uh, uh, redevelopment downtown areas, when I sell my home under Chapter 159 of the Florida State Statutes upon doing a title search at the sale of my home, is this complete street concept being levied against the equity in my home in order to pay for these uh, downtown redevelopment projects. Um, I feel as though allowing such third-party development practices uh, to take place and allowing under Chapter 159 to levy against the equity in my home to pay for such complete streets um, would be called carpet bagging. And I call that into question as to how we're funding such uh, uh, deliberately uh, uh, devised uh, development practices. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Hello. Thank you for the third time. I appreciate it. Um, regarding complete streets, a lot of the public has no idea what a complete street is. It's very nebulous. I've spoken to FDOT about it, and I, I'm trying to work with FDOT because I believe that they believe that that term needs to be clarified and reined in. When somebody talks about complete streets, the public thinks, oh, gee, that sounds really great. And they often don't even see a picture of it when something is proposed. They have no idea of what's being taken out to put a complete street in. I'm not saying I'm against all complete streets, but I think that term is way, way too broad to use when you're talking about projects. You need to be telling the public what that project is and what it's doing and what problem you're solving. Because when we hear about complete streets, we'll hear the 10,000 foot level of we got to do a street for everybody and the birds that fly. Well, how much does that cost? What's the cost benefit? You know, what is the safety issues you're doing? 
But a lot of times you're doing a complete street and doing many, many things, and sometimes you're calling it complete streets and you're not telling public all of the things that you're doing. So again, I think this board needs to be very cautious about the projects that they continue to keep moving forward, especially when you're talking about com putting complete streets all throughout Pinellas County at a time when I just heard you talking about population is growing and I don't believe people want to see their vehicle lanes of traffic being removed. So I just want to put that out there as take a caution, please. Questions from the board? Thoughts? Anyone else from the public? Tina? No, Madam Chair, and you do have a motion and a second on the floor. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> All those in favor, please designate by saying aye. 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 Thank you. All right, and now we are on to appointment to the MPOAC. I'll take this one. Um, this is one of our um, committee appointments, and because of uh, Councilmember Buckman's resi resignation, he was our third alternative, or second alternative. And uh, we would like to have a third alternative because Commissioner Eggers is unable to meet three of the four meetings that are scheduled this year, and um, Councilmember Burke is our second alternative, and I don't think you're available for the 25th. It's not mandatory that we have a governing board member at the MPOAC governing board member, but it's nice. It's nice to show that we're there and, and, and care. Uh, what you need to know about the MPOAC is Commissioner Long, uh, her earlier comments about uh, transportation funding and the training that's provided to MPOs is through the MPO Advisory Council. Uh, and there is a, a two-day course that's in Orlando and in Tampa. And some of you went to that this past year. Some of you went last year. Uh, that is the forum for that. And it is also a forum for us to discuss statewide uh, issues that affect all 27 MPOs in the state of Florida. Uh, and there's, I'll get to the legislative summary here in just a minute. Um, so we are looking for um, a member to volunteer to be a third alternate. It doesn't mandate that you go to the meeting on January 25th or any of the meetings, but it does mean that uh, Tina or I will call upon you if we have an upcoming governing board meeting and nobody able to go. Um, they are typically in Orlando. Uh, sometimes they move around the state. We, of course, will cover your transportation costs if necessary. So we're seeking a volunteer for this appointment. Volunteer. Anyone inclined to volunteer? Hello. <laughs> we'll keep asking until we get one. Uh, it, I think it's cool. Okay. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Scott, thank you so much. We'll need to have the board endorse Since, Commissioner well, Scott. Yeah, but I mean, that's, that's a really great representation for us because Ryan is very familiar with transportation funding issues through his own business, right? Okay, well, look, look, look at the opportunity you have here. You just have to promise to come back and fill us all in. I, I promise I, I, I will do that. So. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor of accepting Commissioner Scott's magnanimous effort to represent us, please. Designate. Madam Chair, I would need a motion and a second before you take a vote, please. A I'm trying to get there, Tina. Give me a moment. <laughs> motion by Albritton. Motion by David Albritton. Sec second by Commissioner uh, Patty from Pinellas Park. Um, all those in favor, please designate by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, now we are on the director's report. Okay, I'll, I'll go through this fairly quickly, except for a little bit of time on the legislative update. Uh, for Spotlight, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. One, um, one of the issues we've been working on for enhancing beach community access is the Dunedin Causeway. And um, earlier today, uh, uh, Rodney Chapman of our staff sent out um, a study uh, report that we completed earlier this year looking at the turnaround at the end of the Causeway Boulevard at the entrance to Honeymoon Island State Park. There is a small circle there, and when uh, people get to the end and they realize that there's a fare or a fee you have to pay to get into the park, some people don't want to pay that fare, it's a up condition 
Uh, we've distributed that report to the county, to the city of Dunedin, to the uh, park uh, manager, and we have a coordination call coming up with the county on January 22nd to talk about some of the findings of that. You, some of you may remember that I wrote a letter to the Department of Environmental Protection Secretary requesting that they fund the roundabout at the end of the Dunedin Causeway to make that a smoother turnaround point and, and more operationally functional. Uh, they wrote back saying, well, we'll have to evaluate whether it's needed after we open up more toll plazas getting into the park. So our study showed that there was clearly a need out there. There were people doing all kinds of crazy stuff. It's not operationally functional. Um, so hopefully we can prevail upon them to assist us uh, with the funding. So stay tuned on that. Just wanted to give you a quick update there. Um, we um, are also about to kick off a project in the Gateway area to do a survey of the employers and businesses and employees in, the, in that area. Uh, we, are, um, we have a scope of service that's been developed and reviewed by the Florida Department of Transportation. They've agreed to match our funding for this project. Uh, however, we're still waiting on the Department of Transportation to put the funding in place to kick that project off. Uh, we hoped we'd have that started by now, but it looks like it may be a month or two out. I'll update you when we're ready to begin on that. That's a key part of the Gateway Master Plan, uh, as is the county's pending uh, future relocation out to the ICOT Center on Olmerton Road. And I have a meeting coming up in the next uh, week or so with Kevin Knutson of the county to talk about that uh, pending uh, relocation of, of the county center out to Olmerton Road. That location was identified in the Gateway Master Plan as a key catalyst redevelopment site. I know the city of Largo is very interested in creating sort of a um, mixed use activity center designation in that area. So uh, we're excited. We think that could be a real catalyst for our Gateway Area Master Plan coming to fruition. And those are the big updates that I have under the spotlight emphasis area. Next step on waterborne transportation, because I know the question will be asked. Um, we are um, working through the city of Clearwater on the, the docking agreement uh, that the ferry has at the marina uh, to understand how that might affect PSTA's pending procurement uh, for the $655,000 grant uh, that we were awarded uh, recently. And um, I have a pending meeting with um, Brian Lowack of Visit St. Pete Clearwater to talk about potential financial participation from the, um, uh, the county's uh, tourism tax to help bring all those dollars together as a local match. So stay tuned on that. Um, hopefully we can get that portion into this year's budget um, and move forward with an operating um, program beginning sometime after October 1st this year. So I have a question on that. Yeah. Where are we, and maybe Commissioner Driscoll knows the answer to this, with the Cross Bay Ferry. Are they gonna operate again? They are operating this year, and I think they still have another year left on that agreement, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so that's, that's ongoing. I think that's, um, they'll be continuing negotiations as that time period starts to wind down. We've got a couple of years left on that. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. And by the way, I'm hearing from a lot of folks that increased waterborne transportation across the bay, more frequency, more times of service, later hours, things like that. Um, there's been some, especially as the Rays potentially develop their stadium site at the gas plant district. Mm -hmm. Well, as those conversations are ongoing and as we continue to work on that huge opportunity right there at the stadium site, I don't think it's too early to start talking about advancing the waterborne transportation opportunities because that's gonna be an unbelievable success story, I do believe, for our whole county. Good point. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Driscoll. I just wanted to add that we're also, um, the city is is making the investments for long-term service for Cross Bay Ferry by um, moving forward with work to construct a permanent ferry dock at the, um, at the St. Pete Pier near where it used to, used to be um, before the new pier was built and that one we actually want um, two if not three 
so that we have one for Cross Bay Ferry year round. Um, another, hopefully, to bring back the tall ship links um, and other um, educational vessels, things like that. And then a third one that could be for another use so that we have that fully activated. Where are we with the tall ships effort? I haven't heard anything about that in a long, long time. I know. I miss it very much. Um, <coughs> it had to, to find another home uh, while we were building the new pier. And um, we haven't been able to get things together to get the new um, dock put in. So we have to... We have to get that done. We have the alternative over at Harborage, but it doesn't have the same attraction. I mean, a lot of the same reasons that we don't prefer to have the Cross Bay Ferry stopping where it is right now. Um, but we work with what we have until we can get things the way we want it. I don't know, but I think they agree with me. Thank you. No kidding. Are they trying to get in through the window, Chelsea? Chelsea's going to solve it. Should I go to the director's report, the rest of my report? Yeah. Okay. Please. Let me move on to the legislative report, and I'll, I'll try to be brief on this one, too. Um, there are some bills of concern, the legislation. You think? A lot surprise, of bills have already surprise. been filed. It's multiple ones. The session started yesterday. Let me highlight a couple. Um, one is Senate Bill 1032 by Senator Gruters. It's a, it's, a, it's a broad transportation bill. Uh, this bill uh, has significant impacts to metropolitan planning organizations uh, and other statewide transportation planning. Uh, just a few of the points here. Um, uh, this would require the Florida Department of Transportation to review each MPO's long-range transportation plan for, quote, productive flow and connectivity of people and freight. If the plan is found to be unsatisfactory or incongruent with the metropolitan area, the DOT will return the plan to the MPO for revision. Oh my God. Um, it will also require the DOT to set quality performance metrics and a min minimum acceptable score to rate, rate each MPO's service to its communities, take into consideration traffic congestion, the utilization rate of multimodal transportation facilities, resident satisfaction and efficiency of the transportation system. Uh, a lot of that seems difficult to measure in some cases. Uh, an MPO d that does not achieve the minimum acceptable score is, um, could potentially be taken over by the Florida Department of Transportation Secretary, Great. who would appoint a new executive director, appoint a new chair, restructure the governing board, potentially merge MPOs, uh, and, and do all sorts of things like that. Um, the cherry on top, in my... Do we have a bad MPO that they're trying to get? Well, who knows? I mean, I don't... I, Back I, in the day with the CRAs, we had a couple bad CRAs. I think that there's a, a wide range of MPOs across the state of Florida. You have large MPOs, uh, and then you have very small MPOs, like Gainesville, the Panhandle, and they all have different contexts. So I don't want to say we have a bad MPO. Um, some MPOs have a staff of four or five people. We have a staff of about 12 or 13, so... Um, that, that work for the MPO. Um, the other, the cherry on top of this bill is if you get the top score, you'll get $5 million to go for a project. So, I mean, I mean we know $5 million doesn't go very far. Um, uh, and there's other things associated with this. This would also abolish the MPO Advisory Council that Commissioner Scott just volunteered to serve on. Uh, it would abolish the Florida Transportation Commission, which recommends the Florida Department of Transportation Secretary to the governor. Um, and uh, then FDOT would, would step in and convene the best practices exchange for MPOs. And we have a great relationship with our Department of Transportation District 7 folks, and we appreciate it. Uh, but MPOs were created by federal government to really be a counterbalance in some cases against state departments of transportation. And not everybody has the same relationship we do. Um, so um, I do think that there's a federal obligation that we need to follow. Uh, there are state statutes that we also need to follow, but, but they're when they're consistent, they need places. to be consistent. And if they're not consistent, then we're obligated to follow the oh federal. Oh my God, guidance. they're nuts. So this just puts us in a really awkward position. Um, this bill, I think, also requires the Lee and Collier MPOs to consider merging, just like the Tampa Bay MPOs were asked last session. Um, I won't go into all the provisions, but please take a look at 1032 
And frankly, I would request support from this board to outline some of the concerns that, that we see with this bill. And if the, if the board is willing to do that, then um, we can draft a letter and, and coordinate that. I will be in Tallahassee on January 23rd with the St. Pete, um, Clearwater, and uh, Beaches Chamber of Commerce. Um, so we'll have an opportunity to meet with them. Well, go and help there as well. Um, I've previously outlined Senate Bill 266 uh, and House Bill 287 by Senator Hooper and Rep. Esposito. Uh, there is a letter that's in your correspondence package that we drafted based on your direction for that one, so I won't spend time on that one. That's been referred to some committees uh, and uh, has begun to be heard. Uh, there is um, uh, Senate Bill 1487, um, which is um, the PSTA uh, bill. And um, we've talked a little bit about that one. Uh, there is um, uh, some changes to the PSTA board structure and requirements that the board approve certain things by a two thirds majority vote. I think many of you are aware of that bill. So Whit, yes. I have a question on these bills that you're referencing coming out of the Senate. Do they have a house companion? The, the first one I mentioned, I'm not aware of having a house companion yet. Uh, that is Senate Bill 1032 on NPOs. The PSTA bill, I'm not certain yet. It, it, the summary says Senate Bill 1487, but Cheney's name is behind that, so I don't know if that's the, the house bill number. That's the house bill number. So we'll have to wait and see on some of these. There, um, there is uh, another bill on transportation that um, directs DOT to preserve a rail corridor with the right-of-way along Interstate 4 between Orlando and Tampa for to be used for advanced multimodal planning. This is Senate Bill 1226 by our Senator DeSegli. Uh, it um, would uh, prohibit public transit providers from using state funds to pro promote any social, political, or ideological message and directs that state transportation trust fund revenues be withheld from transit providers, airports, or ports that promote federal health recommendations to reduce the spread of COVID-19. This bill has not what? yet been referred to any committees. Um, what? Yeah, I'm that doesn't even compute. Uh, I'm serious. Um, we have um, Representative Burfield of Clearwater area and Senator DeSegli have filed a bill, uh, this is House Bill 1275 and Senate Bill 1506 regarding the Strategic Infrastructure Investment Plan. I don't see any real problems with this bill. This would direct DOT to develop a Strategic Infrastructure Investment Plan to address freight mobility infrastructure, including rail, airports, and seaports. That sounds a lot like the Strategic Intermodal System. So um, it seems like we have a lot of that in place. We are monitoring House Bill 479 and Senate Bill 688 regarding alternative mobility funding systems because as you know, we are about to kick off an update of the transportation impact fee, the multimodal impact fee, and <coughs> this legislation could affect uh, how we work through that update. I don't have a lot of details on that, but it is on the, it, it has been referred to three committees uh, and is on the agenda for today's meeting for one of those committees. Uh, there is also by Senator Hooper, Senate Bill 28, which would impose a license tax on, tax on electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid vehicles. This is a way to maybe mitigate some of the loss in gas tax revenue um, for the state, um, but it could also be a disincentive for people to use electric vehicles. Um, there is a sales tax holiday bill for micro-mobility vehicles and personal safety equipment. Uh, there's a House Bill 14 for, or 449 regarding speeding of motor vehicles that would raise the penalties for street racing and to a, fe to a felony, and also uh, anybody operating a, a motor vehicle 30 miles an hour over the speed limit that creates a, that creates a presumption that they're operating in a reckless behavior. Um, again, we have bills on, against violations of vulnerable road users. These bills always get referred to committees and never get taken up by committees. Um, there's um, on tr other bills of interest. Senate Bill 386 relates to affordable housing parking requirements that would reduce um, parking requirements for affordable housing uh, if they're um, at least 75% of the units are affordable 
and they are near a major transportation hub, which is a bus, train, or light rail station with mixed-use development. Um, and Linda, could you maybe address the virtual meetings bills that, are, that have been filed? We've been looking to see if we can have advisory committee meet, meet, meetings held um, in the sunshine virtually, and I think there's a bill that's been filed to that effect. Yes, there's uh, Senate Bill 244 uh, and House Bill 413 address um, a very specific situation where you have a regional citizen volunteer advisory committee of four or more counties. Um, Senate Bill 244 says that the membership must be solely of those four counties. Um, House Bill 413 leaves that solely stipulation out, but also states that the two most distant counties must be at least 100 miles apart. Um, and then in order, you, all of the meetings can take place virtually, but the entity must provide information about how the public can participate and make um, facilities available for the public to come and, and participate. So did you say House Bill 413? Yes. Maybe we could try to get that down to three counties. <laughs> Do you want me to talk about the municipality one too? Sure, go ahead. Okay, there's another uh, pair of House Bill 157 and Senate Bill 894 that would allow a municipality to convene up to two times a year virtually. Um, now you would not be able to take formal action on an ordinance or hold a quasi-judicial hearing, um, but you can otherwise con um, conduct official business. And then you, have, you still have to meet all the public um, notice and participation requirements. Thank you, Linda. I'll leave it at that. There's probably a lot more that'll, that'll come. If you all have questions, please let me know. And uh, again, I'm heading up there on the 23rd and I'd be happy to take up any items. And again, just a reminder that I would like some board direction on that Senate Bill 13, oh, uh, 1032 regarding the MPO takeover. Um, are you working with our county lobbyists? Um, not directly right now, but we have in the past. That might be a good idea. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, is that still, I don't know who that is. It used to be Brian Loack, so. <laughs> uh, I think we're just dealing directly with um, Laura Beamer. Laura Beamer, I know who she is. From yeah. Southern Strategies. Okay. At the moment. Yes. I'm certainly fine with you doing a letter, if that's what you want to do, or go fight that. Um, but I just wanted to let you all know, and I don't know that it affects any of you. We are a golf cart community. And there are other areas in North County that are trying to become golf cart communities. And apparently, in October of last year, this, the state passed a couple of laws that I would like to see, at least one of them, um, wit to talk to people about when he is up there because it's a problem. So they're expanding. Um, they're saying that golf carts can now cross state roads as long as there's a traffic device, which is great, great for us, no problem. Um, but what they're also saying is that golf carts may operate on sidewalks adjacent to state highways only, only if such golf carts um, yield to pedestrians. <laughs> Who's going to manage that? And the sidewalk has to be five foot wide. A, this is the next step to having them on the trail, I'm just saying. But we should never have a motor vehicle like, I mean, we already have problems with bicycles being on a sidewalk and we're building bike lanes. So, uh, you know, this is, and how do you tell people, especially if they're tourists and they're renting a golf cart, how do you tell them that's a state road and that isn't? This is a recipe for disaster, especially for complete streets if we're going for that. So, I mean, I, I, I don't mind the rest of it, but I think that one we need we need to. Okay. We'll look into that one. That's really a good argument for why state legislators should not be dictating local policy. Because they're in Tallahassee, we're here, and, and... And let me just tell you, that, that sidewalk issue actually helps my city. Because I have, you know, we're, we were trying to connect to Ozona. It was just on the other side of Curlew, and they're a golf court, and, and that sidewalk thing could really help us do it. But my God, how do you control that? Well, there's already, just looking on the Pinellas Trail, I mean, it's already being 
I don't want to say overtaken by no, e but by hijacked e electric bikes. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I'm a pretty regular trail user. And they can and be dangerous. Cause they very go, dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Putting golf carts on sidewalks is not really a good idea. I mean, I can see where we might build a separate entity right. for them to connect the two cities. That maybe our city and the county and somebody else coordinates to do. But right. sidewalk. Yeah. Not a good plan. They're for pedestrians. Five feet is way too narrow. I think there's also a speed governor there. It can't be a 45 mile an hour road. It has to be low. It's yeah, not a 45 who, mile an hour road, though. Yeah, I know. But even who, even on small roads, it's a problem. But who enforces it? That's a good question. Yeah. I mean, come on. The you know. I mean, the the idea that you would say, as long as you acquiesce to a pedestrian, right? E-bikes don't. You see, golf carters are, and they go by. At light speed, you don't even hear you do. them coming. And I, and I mean, I want to make these. I want my whole city to be golf cart friendly, and I want to connect to Ozona, but I just see that as being right. a problem. Okay, I will tamp down any discussion of e-bikes for now, because as an e-bike owner, <laughs> I, uh, I like my e-bike. It was, it was you on the <laughs> I, I didn't say I didn't like them. My, my point is, if you're walking yeah, I get and it. you have a stroller with a small child, you can't hear them coming. That's, that's true. And they don't... You need to ring the bell or say, on your left. Even bikers are dangerous, too. They're going 18 miles an hour now. Yeah. I think courtesy is the byword, yeah. Let me, um, let me move on unless there are questions further about the legislative summary. Um, one other item under 8C is the carbon reduction program funding, and uh, this is something that um, has gotten in the news a little bit lately, and uh, I included a letter from Secretary Jared Perdue uh, in your uh, correspondence. Uh, the state of Florida has told the US DOT that um, it will not comply with the uh, um, setting targets for greenhouse gas emission reductions and developing a carbon reduction plan. Um, I think these are um, issues that are, that are more national in, in political scope, uh, but the, there is an effect on Pinellas County and, and the state of Florida because the state was set to get about $320 million uh, from the federal infrastructure law in the carbon reduction program and in our, um, I believe, FY24 budget for the work program, we have some carbon reduction funds that are going towards the Skinner Boulevard project. And um, a lot of the projects in our um, priority list could be funded with carbon reduction funds. So it's disappointing. Uh, I, I think I understand the DOT's rationale for that. There is a lot of ambiguity and a lot of extra work associated with setting greenhouse gas emission targets. But I feel like as an MPO, we're kind of caught in a catch-22 because we have to follow federal law, federal guidance, which says MPOs need to set greenhouse gas emissions. And then when the state says they're not going to do it uh, and they don't provide guidance to the MPOs, then I feel like we're out a little bit on an island. So we're going to continue to seek guidance from the, our District 7 partners. And that's why the MPOAC is a really good forum because we can all come together and talk about how we handle some of these issues. So it's there for information not trying to make a political point or anything, but uh, it does affect our funding uh, on issues like that. The last point I'll mention, and we'll transition to information items, is on February 14th, you do have a workshop um, that's planned. Uh, Valentine's Day? It, it's Valentine's Day, so bring, wear your red, we'll, we'll bring the candy. Um, it is um, scheduled for 10 o'clock in the morning. It will be a working lunch. We will give you a break before the board meeting, and I promise, I promise, we are limiting items on the agenda for the afternoon, so it won't be a long meeting. But we do think once a year it's really good and helpful for us to set aside some time for a workshop. And what you have, I think, in front of you is um, the draft agenda. Uh, we've published this agenda, I believe, Tina, or we're about to. Uh, we're about to publish this agenda uh, and notice it. Um, the things that we really want your feedback on is with the bigger board, 19 members, uh, what are some ways that we can manage um, that? There'll be some things that we're currently doing we probably won't be able to do at the same level with 19 board members. So we'd like your thoughts. Uh, then we also want to do a little bit of a deeper dive into the development of our long range transportation plan that will be adopted this fall. 
So it'll be a good time for you to consider that. Uh, and then we have um, a lot of issues coming up with our uh, planning council budget and our MPO unified planning work program, which is our two-year MPO budget. And we wanna give you a preview and an opportunity to set the agenda for those budgeting documents before we have to get too far into the process with the county or with the state. Um, so if there's anything else or any changes you'd like on this agenda, now would be a great time to hear from you uh, or tomorrow or the next day if you want to communicate with me individually. And that's all I have, Madam Chair. Anyone else have anything to offer, recommend, ask for, or otherwise comment on? Commissioner Burke. I'd just like to say thank you for the December luncheon. That Sorry? Thank you for our lunch in December. Oh, you're and welcome. Meeting. That was very nice of you. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. We should all start planning for the end of the year this year. <laughs> just saying. Well, the year is almost over. What? The year is almost over. That's why I said. <laughs> Maybe we should start thinking this about is a, it now. This is a long-range planning body. Jesus, yes. <laughs> Um Yes, and when we, can we have these nuts with peanuts in them or nuts or something? We can certainly, whatever you'd like. They're so much better with them. Oh, there's always one in every crowd. <laughs> Mr. Albritton, I rarely sit on any board meeting with you and you are so quiet. Don't you want to tell us what's going on in Clearwater? Well, yeah. Uh, Clearwater's got a lot of stuff going on. Mike, please. Councilmember Albritton, Mike. Mike. Oh, okay. There you go. You got an election coming up, baby. We, yeah, we're in the midst of an election season, which was very interesting. And um, I imagine all of them will be uh, turning on the uh, turning it up now till March. One of the uh, things that Clearwater has as a referendum vote on this uh, election, I think is different in the way that we've been having so many candidates run for each seat and we have a plurality voting system in Clearwater that uh, we've had some people elected with uh, less than 50% of the vote. If there's three or four people running, the person that wins will probably not get 50% of the vote. So we've we put a referendum together to bring it to the, to the, uh, you know, the people uh, to, we'll keep it a plurality. If there's two people running and one person gets one vote more than another, they'll be elected. But if there's three or more, the top two will go into a runoff election so what that does, it, uh, it sets two elections possibility for each seat. And because of that, the supervisor elections says, well, March is probably not a good time because we couldn't facilitate two elections then. So that we're gonna move it to the normal state federal election cycle in August and then the runoff will be in November. So uh, if that passes, that, that will change. But I think it's a good thing that there's, we don't have any opposition to it, really, to speak of, uh, organized opposition. Um, the people that are opposed say, well, it's going to cost me a lot more to run, you know, but, you know, if they're well known in the community and people want them to be, to sit and to represent them, they'll help them with their elections. So I think it's a good thing to have somebody sitting on our dais that has 51%, at least 51% of the vote, uh, people putting them there. So. And most of the municipalities have moved to the general election cycle anyway. Yeah, yeah. Just November and we did it like 10 years ago. Yeah. Maybe 12 years we're ago, gonna get best more, thing we ever did. We're going to get more response because people don't, uh, I, I, I'll tell you, most people don't know that there's an election in March. They're they not, don't. They're not ready for it. So, so that's one thing in, in the election season. Uh, number two, Clearwater's going at a new city hall. So. You know, Largo and Dunedin have beat us to it, but, you know, it took us uh, 25 years to make a decision to get a new city hall. And, um, yeah, and it's not going to cost $90 million. Um, 
we've we've got the money budgeted for it. It's a thirty million, thirty two million dollar project. And then we're putting about ten million into the MS Municipal Services building to upgrade that. So a lot of good things happening, and uh, I think next week we'll know about the uh, Clearwater Intermodal Center. Uh, staff and PSTA have been going back and forth on it because we have a, our ordinance is pretty specific about what is required to put something in our downtown. And PSTA, I've been really trying to work with PSTA and our planning department to make this happen, and I, I think we're real, real close. So next week, I. I, I'm hopeful that we'll have a, a positive um, <clears throat> uh, position from our planning department and we can close on the property and start getting that going. So that'll be exciting. Excellent. That's a great report. Two other things real quick. I, I know it's been a long meeting, but Phillies, uh, John Middleton's wife, who's the majority owner of the Phillies, just died last week. Oh, so, so that sorry. the negotiation has been stalled a little bit because she had cancer and we haven't really been able to come to the table. Uh, that will move forward now, I think. Uh, and um, the uh, Gotham um, contract, I think, has been put to bed uh, last week. So those are the developers of the uh, Bluff apartments that we're going to have there. The, the hotel is moving forward. That's going to start shortly next to the library. There'll be a hotel there. And then the old city hall site is the Gotham site. There'll be a 28-story tower with about 400 nice, real, very nice apartments with retail restaurant and a lot of other uh, amenities in there. That'll st that probably won't start till a year from now, but it'll be finished in 26. And, uh, you know, just having that on started, I think you're going to see a lot of other developers want to come downtown, which is what we've been wanting for years. So, Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Gerard, do you have any report from Largo? Uh, we are moving forward with our City Hall, uh, our Horizon West Bay project. Uh, plans are to move in first quarter of <coughs> 25. Uh, we are getting a lot of interest in the uh, retail space on the first floor, which is exciting. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we uh, wrapped up our Housing for All initiatives and in our meetings. Uh, the last one was Monday night. A uh, report to the commission was yesterday. Uh, a lot of great information and insight, and we are going to, and we're already going to work on adjusting our uh, CDC. To, um, to allow for a lot of the innovations that we've been discussing. So uh, happy to share that with anyone who might be interested. Uh, and uh, that's it. Um, our, 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 our elections are in November. Gina, do you have anything from St. Oh, one Pete? final question of, of Mayor uh, uh, Bujowski. Um, this um, golf cart statute that you were talking about, Am I to understand it that you can drive the golf cart as long as you don't run over pedestrians? Is that, is that it? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Sound, sound thinking. Yeah, you agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I don't know who's going to catch you doing it. That's the thing. I, mean, you know. I just want to keep that in mind. I don't own a golf cart. Don't intend to. But. Gina, anything from St. Pete? For the good of the order? Oh, there's, there's always a lot happening in St. Pete. We're off to a great start this year. Um, and you're going to keep us updated on the development at the Tropicana? I certainly will, and it is still moving forward with those conversations. Good. Commissioner Burke, what's going on in Seminole? Madam Chair, it's always sunshine and smiles in Seminole. Oh my God, did you drink the Kool-Aid or what? <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Mohammed. Thank you. Um, what Commissioner Drish uh, Councilmember Driscoll said, um, but we're having a, we're participating in the walking audit, I think um, January 22nd, I'm looking at Valerie. Uh, January 22nd, we'll be doing a walking audit on 49th Street for the uh, Safe Streets for All, and so we're excited about that. 
We've been reaching out to Gulfport, partnering with them on the establishment of a business district, and so coordinating with them around the district and um, transportation has, has been a lot of fun and exciting. And so anybody want to lace up some boots and do a walking audit, come on out on 49th Street, uh, January 22nd. There are two opportunities, one at 2 and then another one at 5 o'clock. So. And everything else will be forthcoming. But thank you. You're welcome. And Patty, do you have update? From Pinellas um, Park? The uh, ag farm that Pinellas Park is unique in having that the city's been doing is up and running and open to various schools and um, tours. And we have all kinds of different animals that the, and teaching that the kids can come out with. And we're also utilizing it. Several different cities have been coming out for the hydroponics and growing. So it's five acres dedicated to teaching about food to table, animals, and so forth. Our uh, youth park is coming along, which is gonna be amazing on 62nd Avenue. And our downtown area is coming along and looks like it's gonna be a really nice area downtown, so. And your elections are when? Ours are in March, so we have one coming up this March. We have two seats that um, have four candidates running for, so. Yeah, it ought to be exciting. Okay, Commissioner Floyd. Yeah, I mean, I think we all know the biggest thing going on in St. Petersburg right now. Uh, one thing I'll touch on is, uh, like, we were talking about short-term rentals earlier, and it was like I looked down in my inbox, and I had two emails about short-term rentals in St. Pete right then. Um, one was a success story about uh, getting rid of one, I guess, and then another one was um, someone complaining about it, and uh, just it's interesting to hear how other cities deal with it because it's like i feel like in st pete it's like playing whack-a-mole like they just <laughs> pop up and we have an ordinance against them that you know is grandfathered and uh anyway um and it's it's always an issue so i was really grateful to hear some of the stuff that um staff brought us on the adus and whatnot and uh definitely be interested in us having a conversation here more about how we av avoid or uh, maintain the short-term rental situation in our cities. Well, there you go, with for a future sure. workshop. Thank you for that suggestion. Uh, Commissioner Scott, how about from your area, which um, is county-wide? Well, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, just thinking about the whole short-term rental thing, I mean, that, that's uh, something that's been a uh, Concern of mine, I have them in my neighborhood. I live in unincorporated Pinellas County. And, and it's something that I get a lot of feedback from constituents on, and you, usually negative feedback. If somebody's emailing us about a short-term run, and it's not normally positive, it's usually, it's usually uh, negative. And um, uh, I sit on the affordable housing uh, committee as well, and we had a good discussion there about, about ADUs and about what do we do to prevent them from becoming short-term rentals. And I, th I think the deed restriction is a really good option to, to accommodate that. And, yeah, I, you know, ADUs are not going to be right in every situation, but it's another tool in the box, I think, that does help us address affordable housing because with so many short-term rentals in the county right now, that's so much inventory that gets taken out of housing. You know, so I almost feel like we're, we're just we're topping up something, we've got a leak, and we're just kind of filling the bucket, and it's just kind of sort of leaking out. So I almost feel like, I feel like we're just kind of treading water, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, the whole affordable housing situation is, you know, whatever we do as, as, as governments, whether it's allowing ADUs or directly incentivizing development, at the end of the day, we're, we're just tweaking the margins. It's a market-driven problem. And it, and, it's, and it requires a, a market-driven solution to that. You know, we, we need to continue to do everything we can, but it's just frustrating because it doesn't feel like we're really making a lot of progress on it. And it is more, it's more exacerbated by the fact that we're already a very developed county. Right. Mm -hmm. So anything that we're doing is really all under the guise of redeveloping, right, Whit? If something's going up, something's coming down, most likely. Yeah or has never been there to begin with, and it requires mm -hmm. a new way of thinking. Right. And all at the same time, integrating transportation opportunities is not always easy because, as I already have said, the public at large doesn't 
very often hear all of these in-depth discussions that mm -hmm. we're trying to, so hard to solve these problems and work through them in a way that's amenable to the general public. And we know no matter what we do, half the people will like it and half of the people right. won't. So you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Yep. Okay, Commissioner or Mayor Biljowski, you have anything for the good of the order that we haven't already discussed? February 10th is when the operating budget will be passed. February 10th. February 10th. Okay, she just gave her advertisement. And uh, for the for the St. Pete people, when is your big pride, uh, pride parade? That's in June, right? Do you know It's in our calendar, I think. Um, well, maybe come in February. The 20th, I think. 22nd? Okay. Of June? Because we're going to be doing our parade event. We don't want to conflict. conflict. We have a parade this weekend as well. You do? Yeah. yeah. Oh, what do you think? MLK. Oh, that's Monday true. Monday morning. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much all for your attention and your good uh, questions and thoughts uh, moving forward with. I'm sure you have nothing to work on for the rest of the year. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We'll see you next month.